Now a hearing on IRS reform and management. This afternoon, IRS Commissioner Charles Rosati and officials from the General Accounting Office, Office of Management and Budget, and others testified on the tax filing agency's reform efforts. The hearing was held jointly by two subcommittees of the House Government Reform Committee, co-chaired by Representative Steve Horn of California and Dave McIntosh of Indiana. It's a little over three hours. The uh, joint meeting of the hearing of the House Subcommittee on Government Management, Information and Technology and the Subcommittee on National Economic Growth, Natural Resources and Regulatory Affairs will come to order. April 15th is tax day for all Americans. It is the day the Internal Revenue Service holds individuals accountable for the accurate reporting of their tax liability. It is fitting that today we hold the IRS accountable as well. In the past years, the Subcommittee on Government Management, Information and Technology has held similar hearings and heard reports of management problems at the Internal Revenue Service. Last year on this date, we heard from the newly appointed Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, Mr. Charles Rosati. He outlined for us his priorities for restructuring and refocusing the IRS. Commissioner Rosati uh, spoke as follows, quote, shifting the entire focus of the agency from one which focuses solely on conducting our own internal operations to one which puts far more emphasis on trying to see things from the point of view of the taxpayers and emphasizing service and fairness to taxpayers. A few months after that testimony, on July 22, 1998, the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998 was signed into law. The underlying theme of the act is one of creating a cultural change within the IRS. In the broadest terms, the act shifts the emphasis of the IRS from its self-defined role of an enforcement agency to a role that resembles more closely a financial service organization. The initiatives presented by the Commissioner last April 15th and the broad array of provisions in the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act seem to go hand in hand. One year has passed since we heard from the Commissioner, and nearly nine months has passed since the enactment of the Restructuring Act. Today we hope to learn of the first steps taken by the Commissioner to restructure and refocus the Internal Revenue Service. I think that's one of the most difficult jobs that has been ever undertaken in government and might well be one of the most difficult ever taken in a human organization. In addition, we need to have a candid discussion of the challenges that lie ahead for the agency. Great things are expected and the road will be difficult. Uh, the Commissioner knows that and most of us know that. However, the effort is much needed and we will all be better off when it has been accomplished. The Government Management Subcommittee will focus on these and other management practice issues within the IRS. I will then yield the chair to Mr. McIntosh, whose subcommittee will examine the agency's record in complying with the Paperwork Reduction Act. That law is intended to reduce the burden of paperwork the federal government places on the American people. The National Economic Growth Subcommittee will focus specifically on the paperwork imposed by the IRS and the Department of Agriculture. Let us begin today by welcoming our witnesses. Mr. Charles Rosati, Commissioner of Internal Revenue Service, has a distinguished career. Uh, he's the type of person that should have long ago been made Commissioner, and we now have one that it has been a chief executive, knows what it is b to be a chief executive. And when you preside over a complicated organization such as the IRS with 102,000 employees, the challenges are obviously great. He will be panel one, and the members on both sides uh, will have the opportunity to question the commissioner after his statement has been made, and we will alternate five minutes each varying between the majority and the minority. On panel two, we will hear from Mr. Nye Stevens, Director of the Federal Management and Workforce Issues at the General Accounting Office, which is the legislative uh, arm of the government and does our program and fiscal accounting. Mrs. Deidre Lee, Acting Deputy Director for Management at the Office of Management and Budget, and Mr. James R. White, Director of Tax Policy and Administrative Issues at the General Accounting Office, will finish out Panel 2. 
Panel three will consist of Mr. Sidney Hoffhay, a taxpayer activist from Phoenix, Arizona, Ms. Kay Whitehead, a pork farmer in Muncie, Indiana, Mr. William N. Lindsay, President of Benefit Management and Design, Incorporated in Denver, Colorado, and Mr. Jack Nicholson, owner of the company Flowers in Arlington, Virginia. On our fourth and final panel, we will hear testimony from Ann Thompson-Reed, Chief Information Officer of the Department of Agriculture. I now yield to Mr. McIntosh for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Horn. It's a delight to be able to co-chair this hearing with you. Um, and welcome, Mr. Rossetti, today. Last year, Congress passed the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act because of its concerns about IRS treatment of taxpayers. Uh, the IRS accounts in addition, for nearly 80 percent of the government-wide paperwork burden on Americans. Uh, this hearing will examine the IRS's failure to initiate any specific actions to reduce paperwork burdens during 1999 and 2000 for any of its 671 tax forms and record-keeping requirements, which impose approximately 5.8 billion hours of burden on the American public. This equates, by the way, to about $154 billion in cost for paperwork compliance. I think of it, and, and it nearly equals the total $182 billion of taxes imposed on businesses in this country each year. Think of it as a hidden tax, an extra tax that goes along with the tax that Americans are paying today on April 15th, because it's a cost that's borne by them in order to comply with the laws as Congress has passed them and the paperwork requirements the IRS uses to uh, collect those revenues. And in addition, we understand from the IRS staff that IRS has not analyzed all of the paperwork imposed on individuals to spare them the burden of providing the same information on multiple tax forms. Also, IRS has not analyzed all paperwork imposed on small businesses to identify duplicative forms burdens on them. I find the agency's lack of effort to be unacceptable and believe the American people will share my assessment. Today's hearing will also examine the Office of Management and Budget's mismanagement of the paperwork burden imposed on American. The OMB is supposed to be the federal government's watchdog agency guarding the public against waste, fraud, and abuse. Yet OMB has failed to push the IRS or, frankly, many other federal agencies to cut existing paperwork burdens on taxpayers. Worse, the GAO confirms today that the OMB has misled the American people, providing a falsely inflated picture of the Clinton administration's paperwork reduction accomplishments. First, I want to turn my attention to the IRS. A survey conducted two years ago found that most respondents would rather undergo root canal surgery than be audited by the IRS. A magazine poll found that the scariest words Americans could imagine hearing when they pick up the telephone are, this is the IRS calling. Indeed, for many Americans, today's hearing falls on the worst day of the year, April 15th, or tax day. And much of their frustration and anger is directed at the government's tax collector, an un unenviable duty that they has been assigned to the IRS. Although I'm very disappointed with their effort or lack of effort to reduce the paperwork burdens, I do not intend at this hearing to take cheap shots, which have been taken by the agency by either for sins of past Congresses or presidents. America should be mad at the unfair and oppressive tax system. But the source of most of the unfairness and oppressiveness is the mind-numbingly complex, economically irrational, special interest-dominated tax code, in other words, 86 years of bad tax policy. The IRS can't be held accountable for that. That's written here in Congress and signed into law by the President. But what I would like to focus on today is how does the IRS take that tax code and translate it into the paperwork that is required by the American people to fill out that message? And I believe right now the staff's putting here the Internal Revenue Code, um, which includes all of the regulations implementing the code of law, to indicate how that has grown in terms of the complexity, just in the sheer volume of the paperwork that is required to produce that. And if it helps policymakers get the message that more and more Americans are sending to Washington, it's time to scrap the code and replace it with uh, something that is economically fair and decent, then I think the hearing will in itself be a success. 
Now, we all know the direct cost of the tax code is about $1.7 trillion that Americans pay in taxes uh, to the government. But there is this hidden cost, which adds an extra 10 percent, or about $154 billion to that burden. Each American spends an estimated of 5.8 hours in complying with the 671 different tax forms. To me, this is unconscionable. And what is even worse is that the IRS projects that this hidden tax burden will go up by 150 million hours in 1999 and 130 million in the year 2000. IRS correctly observes that recent and anticipated statutory changes in the tax code are the driving force behind the growth in the paperwork. And please note that the huge stack of the Internal Revenue Code represents not only the statute, but also the 12,000-some pages of tax regulations used to implement that code. Clearly, the code is too complicated. Nonetheless, that does not excuse the IRS from failing to provide any significant paperwork reducing initiatives for existing forms. I understand there are many that were created as a result of recent tax bills, but there are also many, many, many that have been in existence for some time that could easily be examined to determine whether they're duplicates, whether they need to be filled out in order for the IRS to do its job in com enforcing the tax code. Now let me turn to the entire government's paperwork, which OMB has severely mismanaged. The 1999 Treasury and General Government Appropriations Act required OMB to issue a report by March 31st that identifies specific paperwork reduction accomplishments expected con constituting 5 percent reduction in the paperwork expected for 99 in fiscal year 2000. The next day, I submitted comments that the draft report is not responsive to the statutory requirements in several ways. Um, first of all, OMB estimates a 2.6 percent increase in paperwork requirements for 99 and 2.3 in 2000 instead of a 5 percent decrease in each of those years. This expectation follows three successive years of increases in paperwork instead of decreases. Second, the draft report only identifies some specific reductions. This aspect of the report is not acceptable to us or responsive to the congressional requirement. In fact, IRS and five of the 14 cabinet departments, Energy, Health, Human Services, Housing and Urban Development, State and Veterans Affairs, were unable to identify any specific paperwork reduction initiatives in one of the two years. Now, why didn't the administration say no to these proposed budgets and, read and ask OMB send them back to the agencies? I believe the administration's incredible disregard for the $7 billion of paperwork burden experienced by the American people is insensitive and unacceptable. This burden equates to $185 billion in cost each year, and OMB draft reports includes 872 violations of law last year's alone where the agencies levied unauthorized paperwork burdens on the American people, including over 100 each by the Department of Agriculture, Health and Human Services, and Veteran Affairs. In other words, there were at least 872 times when the Clinton administration required paperwork without the illegal authority to do so. The GAO says, as disconcerting as these violations are, even more troubling is the fact that OMB reflects the hours associated with unauthorized information collections ongoing at the end of the fiscal year as burden reductions. We believe that OMB has an obligation to Congress and the American people to accurately report paperwork burdens imposed on the public and that OMB must immediately take necessary steps to stop the violations. I believe the public deserves substantially more paperwork reduction initiatives by the administration, especially the IRS, the largest component of that hidden tax of paperwork, and an honest accounting to the American people which reflects only actual burden reduction accomplishments and not the total burden. It's only fitting today that tax day that we hold this hearing, and I appreciate Mr. Horn and joining us in a joint hearing on this to find out exactly how we can best reduce the hidden tax of paperwork. I thank the gentleman. That's uh, quite a list of horrors, and I assume it'll come out in the question period a little more. Uh, Commissioner, uh, just and all other witnesses on panels two and three, let me just say what our procedures are. This is an investigating committee, as are most committees, subcommittees of the full committee on government reform. And we swear all witnesses prior to their testimony. When we call on the witness, their statement is automatically part of the record, as well as background information on them and so forth. 
uh, so one doesn't have to ask permission for that. It's in the written record. So, Commissioner, if you would stand, we'll administer the oath. And should we ask the, my colleagues to stand? Uh, well, why don't we get all panels standing? We can have a mass baptism right now okay. and save a lot of time. Right. Raise the right hand, please. And uh, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give the subcommittees in this joint hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The clerk will note that all the witnesses took the oath. And we will begin with then panel one, Commissioner Rosati. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and you must have been the most popular guy in town today. With <laughs> probably, probably the other body, as it is known, also had you over today. Yes. Well, actually, that was there yesterday. But I uh, see. Yes. I, um, but thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and Chairman McIntosh as well. Uh, I, since we have several subjects here, I'd first like to briefly, very briefly, cover this, uh, some topics on management year 2000 and filing season and then go on to a discussion concerning paperwork and taxpayer burden. And Chairman Horn, I know that your subcommittee is concerned with management information and technology, so I think it's actually fitting uh, that you would hold a hearing on the IRS at this time because, uh, as you noted in your opening remarks, the IRS is in fact faced with a massive program of change in all these dimensions, and I've got a few of the initiatives listed over here in bullet point form. Uh, as you noted, last year the Congress passed nearly unanimously the Restructuring and Reform Act, and this act has many important and specific provisions that are all very important. As important as they are, I think collectively the bill said something even more important uh, than any provision, which is that the IRS must fundamentally change our direction. And I think what it was we were told is that we must not only collect taxes, which we must do, but we must think about our job as serving the people who are paying the tax namely the American taxpayers. I believe that we can succeed in this mandate, and as a matter of fact, I think we now know more clearly than we did before uh, what we need to do to succeed. But we also know that the, this involves a lot of changes and some very fundamental changes covering almost all significant aspects of the agency. Some of these changes are intangible, such as how we communicate and define our mission and our goals and our guiding principles. But many of the changes are very tangible, such as how we measure our performance, train people, organize ourselves, as well as many very detailed procedures and especially our technology programs. Collectively, this all affects the uh, skills, attitude, tools that constitute the way we serve taxpayers. Now, in addition, the information technology on which the IRS critically depends, as you have noted, Mr. Chairman, a number of times, is fragile and deficient and I believe cannot be fixed short of nearly a total replacement. Uh, in addition to technology, the other major areas of change to achieve our strategic goals, including re-engineering our basic business processes, which includes uh, many of the uh, aspects that impose burden on taxpayers, such as our forms and filing procedures, as well as our internal organization management and performance measures. And. Uh, recently sent, I believe, to you, uh, both you gentlemen, uh, a copy of a document that we recently wrote called Modernizing America's Tax Agency, which lays out in some detail, which we don't have time for today, uh, this overall program. I do want to note that this is a massive amount of change, and it has to, of course, be coupled with continuing ongoing operations. Uh, and this all means that there is a significant risk uh, in what we're doing, uh, that we may have unanticipated problems and that we may have operational errors um, as we go along. In other words, in the current situation the IRS is in, uh, I don't believe there is any risk-free plan. But although we uh, know that there are inherent risks, knowing that they exist means that we can try to manage them so that no setback is, is fatal and we can be reasonably confident of ultimate success. And in this regard, I'd like to mentioned two important aspects of our management process. One is the need to rigorously set priorities in the light of the fact that we have limited organizational capacity. And the other, of course, is to establish effective management over each of our uh, major change processes. Like any organization, we have limited capacity to, to manage change. Uh, and even before the Congress passed the Restructuring Reform Act and we began our modernization program, the IRS organizational capacity was, in fact, stressed to the, to the maximum in an attempt to respond to uh, actually thousands of individual recommendations that were coming from many studies and proposals, as well as legislative mandates and tax law changes. And uh, 
the process of reacting to this, uh, many inputs was actually using up all of the available capacity without actually, in my view at least, addressing many of the underlying problems. So what we've done now is to establish a set of programs to try to manage these activities and priorities in an orderly way, uh, in, an, in an orderly sequence, so that we attempt to get the most benefit out of the organizational capacity we have, while also building increased capacity to make the improvements come even faster into the future. Uh, now, uh, Chairman McIntosh, I'd like to report uh, just a bit on the one part of our program that is attempting to deal with specifically the paperwork burden aspect of our mission. Um, and I'd just like to note that uh, the situation, the reality that we face is that the growth of the economy, the growth in the complexity of the economy, and the growth of the tax code all combine to not only impose the paperwork burden that you noted in your opening statement, but also to inherently increase it each year. In the filing season that ends today, for example, we expect to receive about 3 percent more total returns. That's because of the growth of the economy. In addition, because of the two recent tax bills that were passed, we're actually revising 153 forms to reflect tax code changes and, unfortunately, actually adding two more forms. Uh, and it's estimated that uh, under our current estimating methodology that those changes alone would add 92 million hours of burden. So when you combine all of these uh, economic growth changes and tax law changes, to we actually increase just by that alone 4.5 percent to the burden of 5.8 billion hours that was already estimated by OMB before. So that's just handling the reality of economic growth and tax code changes. My view of what our mission is and, and what my mission is in, in the agency is we, we, we have to deal with that reality. We have to note that it's there. But our goal is to try to make it as easy as possible for the taxpayers uh, to, to comply with those um, uh, obligations and to essentially rethink our way of doing business as much as is in our control in order to ease, make it as easy as possible for taxpayers to file and pay. Now, as I noted, we do have limited organizational capacity, so we have to set priorities. In order to uh, reconcile these uh, various demands, we've tried to give priority to making those changes that we think will benefit taxpayers as quickly as possible and, of course, also making those changes that are mandated by law, while also working on some longer-term changes that we think will uh, really improve service and reduce burden even more in the future. For the near term, we have basically three strategies uh, that we're pursuing all, all in the near term to deal with this issue. The first is to increase the ability of taxpayers to both file and pay electronically. Uh, which we think eliminates errors and paperwork. Uh, in this filing season, we were successful in increasing electronic filing by about 17 percent uh, of the taxpayers, reaching uh, uh, close, getting close to 30 million. This includes the 5 million telefile returns in which the taxpayers just dial the phone and they don't have to file a return at all or even submit a return. For small businesses, we also have a similar system for quarterly employment tax returns where they can file by telephone uh, without having to actually file at all a, a form. And we're taking a number of steps to try to increase this kind of uh, method of filing. So electronic tax administration is one strategy. A second one is to eliminate the need for some taxpayers to file at all where we can. For example, uh, over the last year, we've raised the threshold for small businesses that are required to make monthly tax deposits. And by doing this, we've eliminated 500,000 small businesses uh, from having to make these monthly deposits at all, which eliminates 6 million pieces of paper. We also have noted that there are some taxpayers who file that don't need to, and we've sent letters to 2 million individual taxpayers uh, simply informing them that based on the data that we have, they didn't need to file returns and encourage them not to file. So, I mean, that's the ultimate paperwork reduction. Just don't get people to file at all. A third thing we're doing is we are working with private contractors. Uh, to help us redesign certain of the forms uh, and instructions that go with them to make them easier to file and less, uh, less error prone. Uh, we know that there are some good expertise in the private sector out there, and I can give you some examples that I have with me of working on this. So we're going to continue uh, aggressively pursue all three of these strategies over the next year within the limits of our capacity. Another major step that we are taking is to redesign the way we measure burden Frankly, the measurements that we have today that uh, are address the question of burden is based on a 15-year-old methodology that uh, is very seriously flawed. 
Uh, I came into office, I looked at this, and I said, this really does not help us very much to help tell what we should be doing. Um, it doesn't take into account, for example, anything about the currently very extensive and growing use of tax preparation software. I think uh, we've learned from our private contractors that this methodology actually sometimes gives us, points us in the wrong direction by telling us that uh, a certain way of designing a form makes it more burdensome when in reality it, it makes it less burdensome. And finally, it doesn't take into account what is uh, some of the, I think, most important kinds of transactions that taxpayers have, which is what happens if there's an error in a form and then it requires interaction with the IRS after the form is filed, what we call post-filing. So we're, we're working with another private contractor to redesign this whole method of measuring, met, uh, measuring burden, which we hope will give us better uh, tools to, to, to improve in the, in the future. And finally, what I think is really the most important step dealing with increasing our, our long-term capacity to improve is redesign our whole organization structure, which has a number of objectives, but one of the most important is, is that it will enable us to put in place uh, a set of management teams that will each have the responsibility for dealing with a particular group of taxpayers. For example, you mentioned small business taxpayers, which is a sector I have some familiarity with, and we know that this is where some of the greatest burdens are, and their needs are very, very different as compared with uh, a typical wage earner who simply files a return once a year uh, and gets a refund in most cases. So as provided by the Restructuring Reform Act, we're putting in place a whole new structure, and I think a part of this is that we will have a team, this will take a few years, of people whose job it will be to understand very clearly the needs, for example, of a small business taxpayer as differentiated from a wage earner, and to have the responsibility for figuring out what we can do uh, to improve the way we provide service to those taxpayers and reduce not only their paperwork burden, but other burdens in dealing with us. Um, so those are some of the approaches that we're attempting to take, uh, recognizing we have many uh, demands on us. We're trying to balance our priorities and, 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 and address what we think will do the most good the quickest. Um, let me stop there. Uh, Mr. Ch both Mr. Chairman Horn and Mr. Chairman McIntosh, I'd be happy to take your questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. We have joined us uh, by Mr. Terry, gentleman from Nebraska, and we've been joined briefly by Mr. Osi, gentleman from California, and we now have the ranking Democrat on the Regulatory Affairs Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Kusnich of Ohio. And uh, I'm going to begin with some questioning, then I'll yield to the co-chairman here, uh, Mr. McIntosh, then we'll yield to the ranking Democrat. Uh, each of us is going to take five minutes, so staff will please monitor the time so we can uh, get through a lot of questioning. I'm curious, since you spoke of uh, significant risk associated with the efforts being undertaken by the IRS, you also stated that there is no low-risk plan. What specific risk management strategies are you deploying? Well, what we've done um, is that we have defined uh, a number of major change areas. For example, the organizational change is one major change area. The replacement of our basic technology systems is another major change area. Year 2000 is another area. There's about five of them. Um, and in each one of these, we have uh, a, a, a whole management process, the top w of which is an executive steering group, which in most cases I'm a member of, and the key executives who are uh, all involved in managing these programs are all part of this process. And then we have a program management office that is staffs the, has the responsibility for day-to-day uh, -day management and oversight of all the activities that are involved in making these changes. Um, I think the most uh, example that we've had, the first one that we established in the example of the one that has had the most uh, immediate impact is Y2K, because we need, as soon as I got in office, I knew that this was clearly a huge change area, over a billion dollars affected everything. We put this process in place. Of course, it's not over until it's over, but one of the most important milestones in this Y2K was just the filing season that just ended because we have almost all of our mission-critical application software systems renovated, made compliant, and put back in, and we knew that with that much change, there could be a lot of risks during the filing season. So one of the risks would have been major failures during the filing season, incorrect notices, delayed refunds, that sort of thing. Well, ha if having I, gotten through that, we, yeah. we, we didn't have any of those things happen. If I might, let's take some of those examples, because I'm sure there's many other things you want to do also. But one of the things that's long concerned me is what happens to the checks that relate to Social Security and Medicare? An employer sends them in, the employee has it deducted from income, 
and uh, my understanding is it simply goes in the Treasury bank account at the end of the day and that there's no separate bank account uh, for what is a trust fund. Now, you have about 14 major trust funds. You're receiving money from employers, employees, all depending on what the law is. Uh, the people that drive up to the gasoline pump, uh, they've got uh, a tax they pay to the federal government to maintain interstate highways and on and on down the line. Uh, how does that system work? And can you really tell as commissioner how much money came in that day for the Social Security Trust Fund, for the Medicare Trust Fund, for the in high Interstate Highway Trust Fund, the Aviation Improvement Fund that we pay excise taxes every time we buy a ticket, and that's to uh, complete, extend, renovate runways around the country. Well, I think your first point is, does the money come in and go into different bank accounts? So clearly, that's, that's not the case. I mean, we receive money uh, from, a, uh, for example, a, uh, an employer. It comes into us, and uh, we process that, get the cash to the Treasury. Most of it comes in electronically now, actually, almost all of it. Um, and then we get the forms that go with it. And in most cases, those forms designate what, uh, what the uh, purpose of the money is. But as you noted, and as GAO has noted, in some cases, the initial transaction that is initiated by the uh, taxpayer does not fully designate exactly which trust fund it's for. So there has to be an estimating process after the fact. Uh, this gets fairly technical, but the net of it is that although we think that these estimating processes are, are reasonably reliable, they are not, uh, and some improvements, as was noted by GAO here, ha have been made, they, they're not 100 percent reliable. And that's for two reasons. One is that some of our systems, our old systems, are not as good as they need to be to be able to do the most accurate accounting. And in a few cases, we don't actually have the source data from the taxpayer to be precise about which um, amount that's been deposited is for a particular trust fund. Yeah, isn't the fact uh, the following, that we really can't account for the dollars that go ultimately to Social Security? Uh, we And I don't understand why not. It seems to me it's very simple. The employer sends his or her half. The employee's half is also sent by the employer. And it clearly is marked or should be Social Security, Medicare Trust Fund. It just seems to me when your office the, and processing centers around the country get those checks, they ought to be able to identify it, put it into a special account in the Treasury. And uh, we don't have that. We have an estimate. Does anybody know if we're off one million, one billion? Here we are trying to use the surplus to uh, give more integrity to the Social Security Fund than it has had. And what's your feeling on this? Can't we solve a simple problem like that? A business would. Well. I think it could be solved. Let's say it, there's very few things I've found uh, at the IRS that, that turn out to be actually simple. Um, I, I think that, but uh, that doesn't mean that they can't be solved. Uh, I think the source of the issue is the fact that there's uh, a, a great deal of cash that comes in through deposits, which in order to make it simple for taxpayers uh, are simply designated as a cash come in. And then when the forms, the actual tax returns are, are filed, uh, there's a need for a reconciliation process, and that's what creates the complexity. Uh, and the need for making estimates. Uh, so, well, I guess I'll just stop there. Well, uh, do you have any concerns that uh, this is misestimated? And who does the estimation work? Well, any time there's an estimate, of course, there could be, there could be errors in estimating. Um, but uh, some of it is done by the Office of Tax Analysis and Treasury, and some of it is done by, the, by, by IRS. And what do they do? Compare notes and say, well, shall we split the difference, or what? Well, that gets into, I think that there's different parts of the estimate that are that have the responsibility of different people. They each have a methodology that they use, which has been, you know, being reviewed constantly by GAO. Uh, clearly, there's room for improvement in those methodologies. But I think if you want to say, what is the solution to this problem? Some of the solution has to do with the computer systems. Some of it, I think, there will always be, even in a business, you have some estimates when you put your financial statements together. They're not always perfect. Uh, the, and some of it gets to a basic issue of do we want to add more burden for taxpayers to pr provide more precision in when they make deposits, what it's for, uh, which would then give us perfectly accurate data as not require estimates. Um, I think that we've been a little reluctant uh, to, to do that because of the very 
points that Mr. McIntosh raised, we don't want to put more burden on the taxpayers. So there are some limitations based on what, we, what kind of burdens we put on the taxpayers. Well, in the age of computers, I think we'd all agree the one thing a computer does is do things that you and I could do, but it does it very fast. And it can handle millions of things when we might still be trying to figure out what our tax form is all about. And uh, it just seems to me that uh, it's a crazy system when some of the many billion dollars, trillions indeed, down the line uh, in these trust funds that we ought to have a very strict policy of putting the money where it belongs at the beginning. Now, I, I'm going to yield to Mr. McIntosh, and maybe we'll carry on this dialogue uh, afterwards. Gentleman from Indiana, five minutes. Th thank you, Mr. Horn. Uh, and Mr. Rossetti, let me tell you, I appreciate hearing those three different areas in which you are working on reducing the burden. Uh, my first question is essentially, why aren't those reflected in the OMB report for 99 or 2000? Um, and 2000 is pretty devastating for the agency where they say you don't have any plans, specific plans to reduce the paperwork burden. And, and if in fact you're doing those three, what happened in the, between the agency plans and the report? Well, I, I think unfortunately one of the things that, uh, that is true is that while we are pursuing those things, um, they tend, to, the, the, in terms of the way that OMB measures burden, the numbers tend to be overwhelmed by the other numbers that uh, represent uh, growth in the in the size of the the number of forms filed and also the um, the uh, number of forms that we have to change and and uh, uh, add uh, elements to because of the tax law. So. I, I don't want to uh, overstate my case. We are making these, these kinds of strategies. We are doing them, but they are relatively limited in their impact as compared with the overwhelming uh, volume of change that we, that we get uh, as a result of tax law and volume increases. And I think that probably is the, is the, is the honest answer to your, to your statement. Then I guess my further question then would be, and I, and I had the staff, I asked them to print out all the forms. They, they told me it would take six hours, so they printed out a list um, of 30-some pages of all the different forms. Not all of those are, are changing because of the economy or are new because of changes in the tax code. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the agency take a further step and adopt a strategy to figure out how we could reduce the, either the number of the forms or the complicated nature yeah. of those? Yeah. And, and that's part of our strategy to do that. I think you know. Here's an example of one that we're working on, that has that we're working with uh, a, a private contractor that we think is one of the best in the country to work on. And you can see this here. This is one example. This is the child credit worksheet, and here's uh, here's uh, what it was before, uh, and here's what it is here. Um, and and you know clearly, uh, by any reasonable estimate, when we get this done, this is going to be a better form. On the other hand, here's another one that they did. Uh, which has to do with Form 8812, and after all the analysis that they've done, uh, it looks better, but it still has the same number of lines on it. So it doesn't always follow that you can, even under the best review, make, make things better. But I think we are going to systematically work on this problem. But I also want to be, be honest and say another aspect of this. If you look on this chart over here, it says process flow to change a form. That's the process that is required. Uh, because of regulation and uh, other uh, constraints to change even one line on one form, okay? And I think you can see right now we're in the process of, for this year having put 153 forms through that process by required by law. That tends to use up a lot of time and an organizational capacity. Uh, and the, 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 this is not something that we can just disband or eliminate based on anything that we do in the area. This requires review by OMB. There's legal reviews to, to ensure that forms conform to, to the law. There are also issues related to pure processing considerations. We have to get our information systems, which are a major problem, to, to be able to process these forms. So these things are all needed in order to just make sure that we're complying with the law and that we can actually mechanically process these forms. This is what I mean by the issue of organizational capacity. There is no possibility that we could take all of the forms on, on your list in, in one year or two years and, and even go through the process we've gone here. Uh, and and, and yeah, but uh, that's not that something that we could promise to do. To say, I mean, you were, you were able to report 130 billion million increased hours in 2000 as projected out. And to, 
Are you telling me essentially you want to put as your agency priority only having your manpower work on ways of increasing the burden and don't want to put anybody to studying and using that process to decrease it? No, I'm, I'm actually saying I mean, I find saying that, that somewhat unconscionable. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that would be unconscionable, but uh, I, I don't think that's what I'm intending to say. I'm saying that our first thing that we have to do is we have to comply with the law. Okay? That uses up a tremendous amount of capacity when you have the tax law change. Uh, I mean, there's just no, no alternative to that. What we're attempting to do is within the available capacity that we have, we're attempting to do projects like this, as many as we can, uh, to improve and simplify forms that are, that are on the books. The other thing we're attempting to do, as I mentioned in my strategy, the other strategy is to eliminate the need to file them at all, which is actually better than redesigning them, because if you can eliminate the need to file, of course, that's a 100 percent reduction. I well, just I want to be honest and say that with the volume of data that we have, the volume of changes, and the capacity that we have, I would not want to commit that we could review every form on the books over the next year or two years. Over the next several years, and as we make the other changes that we're proposing, I think that we can make a dent, at least, in this, and we're certainly going to try. Okay. Well, what my recommendation, and, and I want to see if you think it's reasonable, is to go back and review the submission under the OMB project for reduction and say we can do better than zero, because you've, you've laid out that you have some plans to okay. do some. We'll, we'll, we'll and take spill a look those at out and, and come we'll, up with we'll a take, time we'll table. Take, uh, that's, that's a fair request. We'll take a look at that and, and see if there's some things that are not reflected in there or that we can do, because uh, we definitely are, are, have this as, a, as part of our strategy, and we will attempt to uh, see if we can do better than what's in there. I'll, I'll take that under advisement. And if, I, if we have a extra time, I'd also like to talk with you on your methodology, because I think that's a good project, too, that, on making sure you measure it accurately. Right. Certainly. Thank you. And incidentally, we'd be happy to come in and, and talk to you uh, per, about that methodology because I think that might be something of interest to you. Yeah, I think that we could be exactly. Without that, frankly, we're shooting in the dark. We don't know where we're going. Good. Gentleman from Ohio, ranking member, uh, Mr. Kustinich. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Horn, uh, Mr. McIntosh, members of the committee. Being tax day, I think it's also an appropriate day to thank uh, the people of the United States for their support of this government and the many important functions which this government has on their behalf. Our social security programs, our health, our education, all the many functions of government are funded by the taxpayers of this country. And while we're scrutinizing the collection system, and talking about what we can do to make it work better. We certainly, on this day, owe the thanks of this government to the American people for their support. Now, before I get started with my question, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, like to express concern about the unfortunate partisan title of these proceedings. And I'm going to quote, uh, Clinton Gore versus the American taxpayer. Now, the subject of this hearing is very important. Uh, people want to know what we're doing with their tax dollars and what can be done to make the system better. But I don't believe it adds dignity to these proceedings to cast them in the light of some uh, partisan conflict when uh, the fact is that uh, we work long and hard on many of these issues together to try to find a way to make this uh, system uh, work a little bit better. And, and in that line, I'd like to say that uh, there is strong evidence that the American taxpayer has significantly benefited uh, under uh, Clinton and Gore, President Clinton and Vice President Gore, in that administration in the following ways. The federal budget has gone from a record deficit of $290 billion in 1992 to an expected surplus of $79 billion in fiscal year 1999, which is the largest budget surplus in history. 18 million new jobs have been created, and real wages have risen 6.1 percent after declining 4.3 percent during the previous two administrations. And the unemployment rate has dropped from 7.5 percent in 1992 to 4.2 percent. Now, I've got a long list of the benefits of, uh, that have accrued to the American taxpayers that I'll submit for the record. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Rosati, welcome, Commissioner. Uh, the American taxpayers' uh, paperwork burden is nearly 80 percent 
of the total pa paperwork burden imposed by the federal government. Unfortunately, over the last three years, the IRS paperwork burden has increased by about 6.9 percent. I'm wondering, uh, did legislation passed in 1970, uh, 1997 that cut the capital gains, estate, and gift taxes increase the paperwork burden placed on the American taxpayers, or did it decrease the paperwork burden? Well, I. I know that I have the data here on each one of those changes, and I'd have to look up precisely. I do believe that the, I'm not sure about the estate and gift tax, the, I believe that the uh, Schedule D changes, which are the ones that dealt with capital gains, did have the effect of increasing the complexity of the form. And while I don't have the precise data, I believe that they did. I can get that for you, but I believe So it's that possible that there might be some changes which the taxpayers find to be beneficial to them, which simultaneously may increase the paperwork burden. Is that possible? Well, I, I believe that Congress passes uh, certain provisions which are designed in, in some cases to provide benefits to taxpayers, but in order to administer them, it does require some additional forms. That's true. Th thank you, Commissioner. Now, I, I read a GAO report that was released yesterday showing that large foreign-controlled corporations which are doing business in the United States pay considerably less in U.S. corporate taxes than similarly sized American companies. For example, um, I, I think it was uh, Robert McIntyre, who's the director of the Citizens for Tax Justice, uh, I think he said that paying too much or charging too little in paper transactions with their foreign affiliates is a typical way that multinational companies shift income out of the United States for tax purposes. Uh, my question, Commissioner, is the IRS committing adequate resources to ensure that multinational companies are not inappropriately avoiding paying their fair share of the taxes to this country. Well, th th what you're uh, uh, addressing there is the issue of transfer pricing, which is one of the uh, complex areas of the tax code. It actually applies to both domestically controlled and foreign controlled corporations. And we do have uh, a very, there have been actually some additional regulations issued on that subject by the Treasury um, within the um, uh, within the addition, within the last, uh, uh, I think it was two years, that are specifically aimed at addressing that issue. Uh, so it is an important area of focus. Uh, by the way, in our new organizational structure, we will have a special group that will be focusing on those kinds of things. Commissioner, I'm glad you're acknowledging it's important. My question is, do we have corporations in this country who are basically shifting income out of the United States for tax purposes? Well. If they are, uh, it would only be because we haven't been able to uh, <laughs> find out about it, because that is something that our audit program is designed to detect. And uh, if we do find out about it, they would certainly be given additional assessments to uh, reflect what, what the tax should have been. Uh, the program is not perfect, but it is designed to address that kind of an issue. So we, can you report to this committee as to uh, the prevalence of that? Uh, we will report back what data we have. I'm not sure that we have a, an exact report on that particular subject, but we'll be glad to get back to you and report what information we have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I thank the gentleman. Now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Thank you. I appreciate that. If uh, reducing taxes creates such a uh, paperwork uh, burden, perhaps we should just eliminate. So, uh, Mr. Kucinich, I'm, I'm glad that you're going in the right direction with us. Appreciate that, Dennis. Uh, today, uh, some of my good friends back in Nebraska uh, are filing their taxes with the help of tax preparers, and they fall into the classic group that uh, you wouldn't think would use a tax preparer. And I keep hearing the argument in tax simplification that so few actually itemize and need it, but yet. Uh, at least in our local paper last week showed that almost 60 percent now are using tax preparers. So, uh, first of all, my background is small business. Uh, there's no way I can run a small business without having both a bookkeeper and a CPA to keep track of all, uh, all what I need to do to prepare for our taxes. But I, I'm focusing my questions on the individuals, you know, the, the hardworking people that uh, uh, shouldn't have to hire H&R Block. And if you've seen some of the commercials from some of the tax preparer companies, they feed off of this now. Uh, the, the complication in the forms and the paperwork and put the fear into the average citizen that uh, 
the code, and I think the, that fear is real, is just too complex. So first of all, you know, what paperwork reductions and simplification is the IRS pursuing for, for fiscal year 99 and 2000 that will be benefit specifically the individuals and the individual preparers? The individual taxpayer. Well, I think uh, one of the two, one of the areas that has the characteristic of being, on the one hand, designed to be a benefit for individuals, uh, these are things like especially the child care credit and the earned income tax credit are precisely the kind of thing that affects many individuals, but they also have the characteristic that they require sometimes an additional form to fill out, or in some cases a complicated definition, a complicated form. So one of the areas that we have, as I mentioned in my remarks to Mr. McIntosh, as part of our strategy, we're trying to take some selected forms and some selected areas that affect a large number of people, and with the aid of some outside contractors, and redesigning these to make them as make them easier for people to, to fill out. And this is actually an example uh, which of, of one that we're, two that we're working on are exactly in that area. One is the child credit, which is the $500 per child child credit, which is very important and is one of the reasons refunds are up 15 percent this year, but which in our earlier version had, uh, you know, had this particular form, okay, which admittedly, you know, is not a, a real user-friendly uh, kind, of kind of a form. Um, but it has the information on it that you need it. So what we've done with the aid of our contractor, and we haven't got this out yet, but I'm just giving you a little for you, is we've got this, this form, and I know you can't see it, but I, it's, it's got the information you need. It's a lot simpler, and it reduces the number of lines. Um, now, there's another form that some people, only some people need for that case, which is called the additional child tax credit. And, you know, this is even, even a more complicated one here. Unfortunately, they're not as successful in eliminating, eliminating that because uh, it still is, it's a little bit easier, but it still has nine lines on it because that's, with all the research that's been done, the lowest that you can get down to. But nevertheless, by doing this kind of a process, uh, we can really affect a significant number of people, such as the kind you're talking about, who want to take the child credit, but who, uh, you know, uh, you know, have, 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 have to fill out this form to get through it. Another area that's basically the same kind of a process is the earned income tax credit, which similarly affects, uh, by definition, lower income people, but which has significant complexities to it. So those are the, some of the steps that we're taking uh, in order to deal with this. Another area is that we're trying to make our phone service, I mean, when people do fill it out themselves, they sometimes need to ask questions. It's not just the form itself. Um, and we've tried to improve our phone service. Uh, and we have improved our phones. We've added a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week phone service. And I've personally sat in over this filing season in a number of different locations listening in on these calls. And, of course, a significant number of them do come in precisely from the kind of taxpayer that you're referring to, a person that might be low to middle income. They might be trying to get one of these credits. They know that there is such a thing, but they're not quite sure how to do it. And so in addition to simplifying the forms, we try to provide phone service, uh, as well as internet service, by the way, to help those kind of taxpayers. So that's uh, the kind of strategy that we're attempting to pursue to deal with the kind of situation that you're talking about. Appreciate that. Gentleman uh, is yielding back his time. I'll yield back there. Last uh, all right. Uh, I'll take six minutes then if he's yielding back one minute. Uh, just to round this out as far as the management side is concerned, uh, at our March 1, 1999 hearing, the General Accounting Office discussed the weaknesses in computer security at the Internal Revenue Service. Both internal and external weaknesses were listed. Uh, I wonder to what degree you've had an opportunity as Commissioner to review that matter and what is happening to assure that security, privacy laws, all the rest. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Cosgrave to join me up here, and he's been already sworn in, so I guess we don't have to ask him to, to That's do right. that again. But don't, let me just... It isn't Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen. It's <laughs> him in his own right. Okay. As I think you know, I think you've met Mr. Cosgrave. He right. came in uh, also from outside to, yeah. to help me with this, and uh, I think that before either of us got there, I do want to say that uh, this was a matter that was very seriously you know, that were, was acknowledged there were serious problems, physical security and computer security, 
and there was a step taken that was an important step to set up a high-level security office that reports to the chief information officer. We have two senior individuals that actually happen to come both from GAO that we think are world-class in the security area, and they have put together a multi-year plan. This is not a one-year plan that it deals with. I think it's, I forget in how many specific line items that deal with both, with all dimensions of security. And I think we've got about three quarters of those implemented now. I'd like to ask Paul to elaborate just a minute. Yeah, try to do it in a minute because I've got a lot Very of other questions. The, uh, starting, uh, this program identifies uh, risks from the most uh, serious and works down to the start where we have the most potential with our main, uh, main computer sites. Then we go to our service center computer sites, then our uh, district field offices, and then our our uh, uh, what we call um, POD locations throughout the country. Uh, there's some uh, f uh, almost 500 locations, so it's quite an extensive uh, number of facilities that we have to track uh, security on. The program that's run by Mr. Baptiste is actually here at the end. Uh, uh, is a, a very extensive program. There's over over 60 people in his employ overseeing that program, and we've been working uh, down the risks. We've uh, in the computer area. Uh, already corrected over 80 percent of the risks that were identified in that GAO report over two years ago, and we're continually uh, uh, mounting that on a high risk, uh, managing the risk. Now, now you have equipment to trace uh, who is interfering, or do you not, uh, in terms of high school students saying, gee, let's see what's in the IRS files today? Uh, yes, we have most of the standard uh, technology in place. In fact, we work with uh, uh, NSA and other folks in terms of uh, in this organization, et cetera, in terms of making sure we're up to date on all that. Uh, we employ firewalls and things of that sort, which essentially keep uh, the parts of the IRS, such as the website, which is uh, being used uh, uh, about 153 percent increase this year in hits on the website, um, over 600 million hits this year, but that's people accessing it for legitimate purposes. How that's many? isolated through firewalls, so they can't get into any of the taxpayer How many data. access that they were not legitimate purposes. Do we know that? Uh, I don't Answer's have specific no. data for you on that. No. Answer is no. Uh, Commissioner, are you optimistic that that can get under control at least in the next six months? I excuse me, I'm sorry. Hey, are you optimistic that you will have the security situation solved in the next six months, as GAO General Accounting Office noted? I do not believe that we will have everything solved in the no. next six months. No, I think we, we have already addressed the top two levels. Uh, this is a high priority. Yes. Com Com yeah. Commissioner Horn, as, uh, 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 Chairman Horn, sorry. As I had indicated, uh, over 80 percent of the GAO problems have been identified. It's very difficult for us in open session here to give you any specifics just to the okay, nature we'll of this matter. So in closed session, we'll we'd be glad to give you a lot more detail. Later. But, but, but it is, it is, I answer your question, it is absolutely a priority. And I think we've already addressed the most serious high-risk issues, yeah. frankly. Uh, let me ask briefly, this is before your time, Commissioner, but IRS blew $4 billion on a computer system that didn't work. Uh, isn't there a chance that some major businesses, maybe mail order businesses or something, have computers that you can get them off the shelf that would solve some of your problems? How do you, you're an expert in this area, yeah. how do you feel about it? Yeah. Well, actually, the two of us both came from the same kind of background. We were competitors with each other, but now we're, we're <laughs> on the same team. But, uh, and we both went through 25 years in the business of doing those kind of systems. And I think we're here because we're determined to not let that kind of problem happen again. I think on the specific issue of using off-the-shelf software, our, whole, our strategy is to use outside expertise. That's why we've got Computer Sciences Corporation you know, to help us do this and to use off-the-shelf comp you know, products as much as right. we can. Now, we can use a lot of off-the-shelf products. Uh, certainly, all the basic technology can be off-the-shelf, all the operating systems, the hardware, and telecommunications and those things. And in some cases, there is application software that we can use. It does have to be integrated because we are in a tax processing environment, so it isn't like we can take the whole thing off the shelf. My penultimate question here is, how much has IRS now written off that they cannot collect? When I got my debt collection bill with Mrs. Maloney uh, on the books in 1996, uh, that uh, situation was at about 110 billion, and she had the then commissioner had another pool of 60 billion and thought she could collect more out of that, but there well. was no organization. So what's happening on that front? Well, th th this this is a topic that. Uh, <laughs> deserves a longer discussion, but I think that, you know, 
the IRS, the way it's done now is, is in terms of tracking accounts receivable is, is a very confusing, frankly, a very confusing and not very management oriented approach. But part of it is because there's a law that says we have to keep everything, everything that's on for 10 years and that adds up to a number that's 222 billion, which is a number that's published. But as GAO has noted, that really has, that's not comparable to what anybody in the real world would consider. There's about 103 billion that is uh, potentially realizable receivables, that's about half, uh, that, that have some potential for collecting. But when you really get down to what GAO considers to be, you know, the normal receivables, the, the, the actual financial receivables, that gets down to about $23 billion, which is more realistic estimate of what the total receivables are that, that we're in the collection business to go after. Yeah, so you're organizing a systematic collection business to go after it? We, 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 we are, but, but I, again, wanna, I want to be very uh, frank and realistic about this topic, okay? I mean, we have massive room for improvement in the way that the IRS goes about our whole collections process. Um, it is not that, that there's no, clearly collections one of our main businesses, uh, but we have some very archaic computer systems. Uh, they, in turn, constrain, you know, what we can do. We have some uh, organizational structures that are not very, uh, conducive to, to, the, to a modern approach. So a major part of our whole reorganization, our new technology, those two pieces are going to address the issue of really positioning us to do a, what I consider to be a far more modern kind of approach to doing collections. And there is room, very significant room for improvement over time, but it's not going to be well, before fast. You, before you arrived, I suggested that they use uh, regular bill collectors, and I was given this argument, oh no, the privacy laws. Privacy laws, I don't think, pertain here. Just give them the address, give them the amount, n have them knock on the door. If they can't get it and there's something that IRS, the uh, client, customer, thinks about, uh, says, gee, you know, that's where my fight is, fine, bring IRS into it. But uh, in the meantime, it's if you don't go after debts, people think it's a grant within a few months, gee, you know. And, of course, I regarded the $110 billion back in 1995, started mostly in 91, but really accelerated. Uh, I regard that as a national scandal, that we can't lower that amount. And I don't know, you know, people listening today say, gee, why should I file my tax form when somebody's in that pile of 110 billion or whatever? Yeah. And so that bothers me. I'll save my final question for the next round, and I'll yield to Chairman McIntosh now. I, I noticed that our colleague Ryan came in, and so I, I'll oh. yield my time to him oh. if he has a question. Sure. And take it after. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, Mr. Rosati. Uh, I'd like to ask you a couple questions about the duplication of information required in our various tax forms. Have you made a cross-cutting analysis on how we can re weed out the type of duplication, duplicative information required on different tax forms? Specifically, just went through the experience of going through my Schedule D. Uh, looking at Schedule E, a lot of the same information required on those things. Have you identified a solution toward rooting out that type of duplication? If not, uh, what's the status? Thanks. Well, um, <coughs> could I ask my colleague here to come up and answer that specific question? Uh, <coughs> this is Linda Willis, who has, who has joined us. She was formerly with GAO and is working with me on this particular initiative. Congressman, we have not specifically put in place a program that would allow us to go in and look at every single item on a form or a set of forms for a group of taxpayers to look at redundancy. One of the things that we hope to do under the new burden methodology that we're developing is after we're in a position to identify sources and causes of burden, that we will then be able to go in and look at the entire inventory of forms used by a particular set of taxpayers and do exactly what you're talking about. Is there a way that we can take the whole inventory and streamline it in such a fashion that we reduce redundancy, we make it less burdensome to provide, and easier for the taxpayer to comply? When is this going to be ready? We are into the design phase of the new burden, burden estimating methodology, and by that I mean we are identifying the survey instruments that we need to collect the data. We're in the process of getting feedback from focus groups of taxpayers. One of the things that we want very much to know from taxpayers is an issue that came up earlier around what are the circumstances under which you decide to use a preparer. 
and are there things that we can do to facilitate either people doing their wrong or you know their decision in terms of using up repair we hope to be out and have the, the structure of the model finished with this this summer uh, but my guess is it probably will not be up and operating until probably fiscal year 2001. Do you have a timeline that you've prepared an objective and what are the what are the, the final results that you hope to achieve with this? We hope to achieve a burden model that will not only estimate the amount of time that taxpayers spend complying with the tax code from start to finish, pre-filing, filing, and post-filing, but also to be able to develop it in such a fashion that we can look at segments of taxpayers as well as types of activities and essentially disaggregate the data to a point where we can identify specific types of initiatives that IRS can undertake that will reduce burden across the board. I mean, in some cases, when we're looking at post-filing burden, for example, we're better off looking earlier in the process and preventing the problem in the first place. And so this model is designed to allow us to look at that and also to look at where our resources can best be spent in assisting taxpayers to comply and understand the tax code. Could I, could I just make one additional comment? One of the things that, uh, excuse me, I mean, just say, one, one of the reasons that we really need to rethink this whole thing is because of technology. I mean, with tax preparation software and with things like, including some that's now available for free on the internet, you know, it really changes the whole way that you do things because, for example, you can make, enter something once and it yeah. picks it up yeah. on the other form. So it's not just the forms design. We need to look at the, under, the technology that people use. Because yeah, I understand that the need to do a new model, but um, we have a lot of duplication that exists right now. Mm -hmm. And in the interim, with the FY2000, with the FY99 uh, tax work we're doing in preparation of the new codes for next year, aren't there interim things you could do to weed out this well, I, I, duplication I we have? I, there may be. Okay, and I think before, just before you came in, I made a commitment okay. to Mr. McIntosh that we would take another look at the 2000 program. I mean, because of a number of things we discussed, our organizational capacity, the tax load changes, and that chart which shows what we have to do to change one line in the form. Mm -hmm. We can't, frankly, you know, commit to say we'll review every forum and we'd add duplication. But I don't want to imply that there's nothing we can do. And I think uh, th it's certainly a very good request, a fair request, that we take a look at the plan that we have for 2000 and see if there's, there are some things underway, but perhaps there are, is more that we can do and we will take a look at that. Okay. And, and as a matter of fact, we'll, we'll report back to you. Yeah, um, because, you know, when you, when you have a, a goal of two years out, it always seems yeah. to be pushed back every two well, years. We, we, we're trying to do things basically on two paths. One path is what we can do now within the next year, and we only can do so many, so many things, but we have quite a few underway, and we have a process to prioritize those. And then we have things that we're doing to, like, developing a whole new methodology in order to get us a, in a better shape for the future. Um, naturally, there's a lot of pressure to put more things into the current year, and we can't always accommodate them, but we will take a look at, 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 okay. at this suggestion. I think it's a good one, and we'll see what we can come up with for 2000. Great. Thank you. I yield back to the chairman. If Mr. Arnold, let me I just yes. have a quick question on a totally Five different to matter. The Chairman McIntosh. Oh, okay. Well, Mr. Rosotti, this is a different subject matter, but while I've got you, I, it's an area I've been working on. Okay. And, uh, Jerry Weller and I have introduced b a bill to eliminate the marriage penalty, and there are several ways of doing that. But I, I wanted to ask you if you have focused at all on that and if you would agree with us that the marriage penalty it undermines or causes harm to the family structure when you place that additional financial burden on them? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't want to appear to be ducking your question, but I think in this case, I have to say that we have a pretty clear delineation between what the Treasury's responsibility is and what IRS is, and a question like that really is one that, uh, you know, is, is, is not within my scope. Uh, I have a big scope at the IRS, but there are some limits on it, and uh, I think that that really is a tax policy question that I'm afraid I have to defer to the Treasury on. I'm, Okay, I might ask your help then in getting someone over there to focus on that as well, but I thought I'd check while you were here. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm sure the commissioner's in favor of marriage, and uh, this, yes. would help, uh, this would help I would, solve I would, that problem. I don't think that's outside my scope to say that I, I, am, right. I am in favor of marriage, yes. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, the ranking Democrat. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, when Congress acted in the last term uh, out of concern for how the American taxpayers were being treated by IRS personnel. The intention was to make the IRS more 
taxpayer friendly uh, can you give us an accounting as to how the work which congress had asked for uh, was done inside the i r s to communicate to the employees the importance of uh, being uh, gentle with those taxpayers who may have some conflicts with the i r s or may have some questions that they need help in, an in an answering yes uh, i I think that you 're right that that is that basic direction is the direction we 've been given I think it goes even a little bit more than just being friendly. I think what we're trying to do is go beyond that and to actually understand what the taxpayer's problem is and be as helpful as we can in solving right. that. And there are many things that we've done, but let me just summarize a few. Um, to, for the for this sort of a typical average taxpayer, we've tried to be more accessible this filing season by opening the phones 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and opening on Saturdays for people to come in in person and get uh, get information and help. Okay, that's been very important for the filing season. A second thing is for people who have uh, more difficult kinds of problems that have been lingering, and we unfortunately have some of those, we've set up what are called problem-solving days where each month in every area of the country we have uh, special uh, days where people can come in or make appointments. We have quite a few people there from different parts of the IRS so they can solve problems quickly. Uh, we've also reorganized the whole National Taxpayer Advocate Organization, which is there to basically assist any taxpayer that doesn't get the service that they need. More broadly than that, we've developed a whole n uh, new system of measurements, and this really goes to the heart of your question about how do we get across the, to people uh, what they should be doing, whereas previously the focus was very heavily on only how much, quote, enforcement dollars were brought in. We've, we've eliminated that system, and we're rolling out a whole new system of the way we measure performance. Uh, for our organization and also rewriting all the job descriptions for every one of our frontline contact employees. I, I, I could go on and on. I don't, I don't know how much longer you want me to say, but there's, a, there's an entire program uh, of training that goes beyond, goes with this. Uh, millions of person hours of training being invested this calendar year and this fiscal year to basically deal with these kinds of subjects. So it's a very broad, pr pr comprehensive program, but even with all that, it's a multi-year program. It's not something that we are going to claim is going to be successful or completed this, this fiscal year. Well, as painful as the experience of having to uh, meet the tax man happens to be, I'm sure the American people want to know that you are taking steps to make sure that such an encounter is done with uh, less intimidation, which the American taxpayers feel they experienced in the past. Couldn't agree more. So are you going to be... Uh, is there a way that you can communicate to the Congress the uh, kinds of success that you've experienced in this uh, uh, new attempt by the IRS to uh, be more responsive and more, even more service-oriented? Yes. I, I think that there are a number of things that we can communicate. I'd be glad to give you some additional information about some of the activities we're getting. Of course, the feedback from the taxpayers is something that's going to take time, but one of the key things that, that I think will be a measurement is that we're actually surveying Every time we have a transaction with a taxpayer, whether it be an audit, collection actions, phone call, we are now have an outside market survey firm that is uh, doing a statistical sample of the people we interact with and getting ratings uh, by the taxpayer of how they feel about this. Now, this is going to take some time to accumulate the data, but, but by the end of this fiscal year, we will have some of that data to report. I think that's good. I mean, people, we want, the Congress obviously would be interested in getting some feedback about how our constituents are, are, are being treated, and we'd also welcome hearing from constituents on on the issues and how this uh, IRS's new approach is working. I'm, I'm confident that uh, under you, Mr. Rosati, that the uh, IRS is going to respond to the challenge. And I know that you have a lot, you know, you have a, a lot of really good, competent employees who are, uh, who I think are, are easily adaptable to uh, a, a call for uh, more responsiveness, more service-oriented and uh, uh, more congenial approach to this very difficult job of, yeah. of collecting taxes. I, I, actually, I appreciate that comment. I'm sure our employees do because I have to tell you that I haven't met very many employees who like to make taxpayers unhappy. I mean, sometimes they, they have to give them an answer that they don't like. But I think with some training and some additional support, uh, we're already finding that there can be a far better relationship. There, in most cases, in the vast majority of cases, there's not, there's not need to be an adversarial relationship between an individual one-on-one -on -one IRS employee and a taxpayer. Well, please let the employees know that we appreciate their efforts to be more responsive. You can be sure that I will, and I appreciate that comment very much.
I agree with the gentleman from Ohio, and uh, what's been lacking in IRS, very frankly, is good management. And I would hope, uh, and I think you provide that good management, and I would hope that uh, extensive training goes on from supervisors up well, to management. I, I, I really want to stress that. I know it's not the subject of this hearing, but in the appropriations hearing and the other hearings, I want to stress that in terms of short-term and a most immediate need, rectifying the tra what I call the training deficit or the training gap is absolutely critical. I mean, uh, th every employee that I've talked to virtually identifies that as the number one constraint they have in terms of providing good service to taxpayers, and we are investing a very significant amount of time in training this fiscal year. Okay, good. Um, my last question, and we'll go into recess for a few minutes. Mr. McIntosh will be back. Uh, the IRS Restructuring Act of 1999 required the creation of an Internal Revenue Service Oversight Board. Under that law, the President was required to submit nominations within six months of enactment. It has now been almost ten months, and the President has not yet sent one name even for consideration by the Senate. And I want to read to you into the record a letter which went today to the President from the Majority Leader of the House, Mr. Army, a distinguished Ph.D. economist, and also uh, one who is vitally interested in good management in the executive branch and works very closely with our subcommittee. And he said, Dear Mr. President, last summer after extensive review of the abusive practices of the IRS, this Congress passed and you signed the Internal Revenue Service Restructuring and Reform Act of 1999. This historic piece of legislation forces the IRS to be more honest, open, and fair to the American taxpayer. A major part of that law was the creation of the IRS Oversight Board, for which you were required to submit nominations within six months of enactment. It has now been almost ten months, and I'm deeply disappointed that you have yet to submit even one name for consideration by the Senate. In passing and signing this law, you joined us in not only reforming the IRS, but in promising to vigilantly oversee its future actions. Your failure to submit nominations for the Oversight Board breaks that promise. Today, on the day when so many Americans are struggling with the intrusive, complicated tax code, I urge you to meet your legal obligation to IRS oversight. Ignoring this duty demonstrates to the American people that IRS abuses, abuses are not a major concern for this administration, and American taxpayers deserve better, respectfully, Dick Armey, member of Congress, majority leader. Now, do you have any idea, Commissioner, why the President is not meeting his legal obligation to IRS oversight? Well, uh, the only information I have is that the um, nominees, that there has been a set of nominees that are going through the vetting process, which takes some time. Uh, but I, beyond that, I, I really don't know. I, so I have no some have been submitted to the White House. From various sources, I would I, I, re I really think it's better to talk to the White I, I really am not part of that process, uh, except yeah. very indirectly, so I can't really comment. Yeah. So, well, uh, obviously the Secretary of the Treasury is the one that uh, should be submitting them. And yes. uh, I'm sure that uh, either the letter will be sent to him by the White House, but somebody ought to conform with the law. And I think that's what this gets down to. I realize you aren't in it. Uh, that's above your pay grade, as the exactly. saying goes. That's right. But uh, we thank you for coming here, and uh, we thank you for your excellent testimony. And as I've told you for years, you're the guy that can get the job done. Thank so you. So thanks man. very much. And panel two can take be seated now. And Mr. McIntosh will preside in a few minutes. We're in recess until he returns. Thank you very much. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. It's good. Good to see you. Thank you. You can see this from McIntyre.
The subcommittees will come to order. Uh, now call forward the second panel. Uh, let the record reflect that Chairman Horn asked each of the witnesses to swear to take, take the appropriate oath, and they're duly sworn in. Our first witness on the second panel is Mr. Nye Stevens, who is the Director of Federal Management and Workforce Issues for the General Accounting Office. Uh, Mr. Stevens, as Mr. Horn uh, pointed out, your full testimony will be included in the record. Uh, feel free to share with us a summary of that testimony. Okay, I'll, I'll be very brief, Mr. Chairman, in uh, describing the, the work that we've recently done on the Paperwork Reduction Act, which uh, required OMB to establish goals for the executive branch to um, reduce the paperwork burden that it imposes on the American public uh, by 25 percent from the approximately 7 billion hours uh, that it imposed in 1995. The bottom line is that there has barely been any reduction, uh, less than one half of one percent over that three-year period. And projections in OMB's latest information collection budget uh, that are just released show that the burden, rather than going down in the next two years, is, uh, is actually going to be going up, and up by hundreds of millions of hours. There is no question that IRS, uh, from whom you just heard, accounts for uh, the vast majority of this burden, more than 80 percent of it. And it was an increase in the IRS burden that offset a 23 percent reduction among the other agencies of government and, uh, uh, and resulted in the fact that the overall government burden on the American people was kept about even for that three-year period. If it were not for a 7 percent increase in the IRS burden, the rest of the government would have come close to meeting that 25 percent goal uh, for the past three years. Um, and IRS also accounts for about 85 percent of the 468 million of hours of the increase in paperwork that's projected uh, for the next uh, two years. It is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at OMB that is meant to monitor and control the paperwork load. Our reviews of their actions have shown that um, in many ways they've fallen short. Uh, for each of the past three years, for example, they did not set agency goals for paperwork work reduction until uh, the year was almost over. And it was far too late to serve as a goal in the sense of affecting agency behavior during the year. OMB also sees no necessary connection uh, between the government-wide goal, uh, which is set in law, and the goals of individual agencies. So even though OMB can show you in writing that it has a goal of reducing government paperwork by 5 percent this year, in fact, the in information collection budget will show that in the individual goals add up to an increase, not to a decrease. Uh, and of course, that is led by IRS. The second general issue you asked us to address uh, was the matter of expired OMB authorizations to collect data. The Paperwork Reduction Act prohibits agencies from collecting information from the public unless OMB has approved the, da the data collection and given it a control number so that the public uh, will know that it's authorized. OMB may not, may not approve a, a collection for more than three years at a time. Now, our review of information that OMB provided to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, shows that a there's a troubling disregard by the agencies for this control mechanism. First of all, the current information budget contains a 59-page listing of more than 800 violations of the Act, including continuing collections whose authorizations have expired and collections that were never authorized in the first place. The information that e OMB provided focused on the largest of these collections involving those that involve more than 500,000 uh, burden hours. And of these, 17 uh, were being carried out after OMB's approval had, had expired. We added to that um, another 11 that had been continued for a period of time, a limited period of time, because they were reauthorized, but they were operating without an authorization for some period of time. Um, these added up to more than 111 million hours of, um, of unauthorized burden. And I would point out that this has a real cost uh, for the American people using an OMB figure of $26.50 per hour of time that is devoted to tax paperwork, we estimated that those 111 million hours cost the American public uh, more than $3 billion. As disconcerting as these violations are, it's even more troubling uh, that OMB treats the, uh, the, the authorized, the exp expirations of authorized collections as a reduction in burden. So if the authorization for collection has expired, uh, when OMB totals up the burden at the end of the uh, fiscal year, OMB counts it as a reduction, even though in many cases uh, the information continues to be collected. The public notices no difference. I can use the Department of Agriculture as an example of this, Mr. Chairman, because you're about to, to hear from them. Uh, USDA can be seen as one of the success stories 
Um, it reduced its reported burden by 59 million hours uh, since the end of fiscal year 1995 uh, uh, to a total of 72 million hours. However, this total ignored five large data collections where the authorizations had expired and, the, and they were not in effect at the end of the year, even though the information was still being collected. This totaled about 15 million hours. We found another 3 million hours that were associated with 57 other collections in the list of violations of somewhat smaller scale. And the, so the real agriculture burden, we calculate at about 90 million hours instead of the 72 that are shown in OMB's current report. Now, OMB is certainly on record as taking the compliance problem seriously, uh, but it claims it does not have the power to do much about it other than publish the violations uh, as they have indeed done in the, in the list that we just referred to. Um, we think that OMB could do more than that, including bringing to bear the influence of the budget examiners or the uh, resource management officers, and even of the vice president, who is charged under executive order 12866 with a coordinative role of a regulatory uh, review and, and, and policy. And I'll be glad to respond to any questions you have when the other witnesses have spoken. Great. Um, let me ask you just to repeat that to make sure I understood it fully. What was the that you said at the end of your testimony? Um, I said that OMB is not really powerless in, in policing, uh, in, in its ability to police uh, violations of the act, which, is, which are substantial, that it could certainly use the budget powers of the agency, but it could also, I believe, uh, our, our statement calls for using the, uh, the influence of the vice president, who is, a, um, who is charged under executive order 12866 with a coordinative role over regulatory uh, policy and review. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Um, our next witness on this panel is uh, the Acting Deputy Director for Management at the Office of Management and Budget, Mrs. Deidre Lee. She's also a full-time position of Administrator in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, OFPP. And I appreciate the difficulty of coming in as an acting uh, in that position, but thank you for coming and testifying today, Ms. Lee. Uh, again, your full testimony will be put in the record, and feel free to summarize and respond to anything Mr. Stevens has said. Thank you, Mr. McIntosh. Uh, good afternoon. You invited me here to discuss the reductions, the paperwork reduction in fiscal years 1999 and 2000, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to appear. We have recently presented to you the information collection budget of the United States for fiscal year 1999, and I know you're familiar with that rather thick document, and there are also copies available on the table in the back, and we will be discussing that today. This extensive report provides a detailed accounting of agency paperwork activities, accomplishments, and planned initiatives. However, we also recognize that we need to continue working to minimize paperwork burden to the public. We look forward to working with the Congress, the agencies, and the public to build on these successes and to ad address the challenges which are described in this year's budget. The enactment of the Paperwork Reduction Act of 1995 was an important step in improving the way the federal government functions. In providing a framework for managing information, the Paperwork Reduction Act sets out a number of purposes that include reducing information collection burdens imposed on the public, increasing the productivity, effect, efficiency, and effectiveness of federal programs, and balancing the practical utility of information collection against the burden they impose. Under the Paperwork Reduction Act, the agencies and the OMB have specific roles intended to help achieve the purposes of the Act. The Paperwork Reduction Act requires the head of each agency, supported by his or her chief information officer, to be responsible for the agency's information collection activities, including the reduction of paperwork burden. Although the, through the development of the information collection budget, OIRA, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, located in OMB, oversees agency paperwork management. OIRA, through the ICB process, the, the budget process, reports on significant improvements in agency information collection during the previous fiscal year, identifies burden decreases or increases, and indicates areas where further improvement is needed. This year's information collection budget highlights a large number of paperwork accomplishments and improvements. The ICB details these efforts and plans agency by agency. My written testimony describes them in detail and gives some specific examples, but in the interest of time here, I'd like to just summarize the initiatives. And those are, agencies are reducing information collection burden by revising existing regulations to eliminate unnecessary requirements, and I think we saw some examples there from the IRS. They're also raising thresholds to reduce the number of reports, 
making their forms simpler to read and easier to fill out, and thus improving programs for the general public public's application process, cutting frequency of periodic reporting requirements, and trying to reduce duplicative information from one report to a next, one of the, the other concerns expressed by a subcommittee member, putting in place electronic systems that can speed the exchange of information between the government and the public and allow respondents to use their own information technology to ease reporting burdens. They're consolidating information collections both to simplify the collections and to avoid collecting similar information several times from the same people and working together across agencies to share information so that people need only respond to a single collection from an agency rather than multiple collections from multiple agencies. The information collection budget is also the management oversight me mechanism through which agency CIOs and OIRA establish agency paperwork reduction targets. Kind of an interesting term to me. But they establish these for the coming year and they take into account the agency's anticipated program and statutory initiatives. And again, this was discussed rather detail in the IRS presentation. The targets for FY99 and 2000 do not meet the cumulative government 5% reduction goal. They ag the aggregate goal for 1999 is two plus 2.6% and for FY2000 is plus 2.3%. However, some agencies have done extremely well. For example, FEMA, Veterans Affairs, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Energy and Education all have plan reductions for 1999 exceeding 10 percent. But this is offset by increases in other agencies, specifically the IRS, as we discussed earlier, which accounts for 80 percent of the burden. And they have the new tax measures. Also, HHS has several important health programs that have upped the burden. And Commerce has patents and sentence, sentence, census, which will increase the burden. So although, and I know you're going to hear from agriculture and some of the other activities they have today. So while the paperwork reduction acknowledges federal agencies' legitimate need for information to perform their missions, it also requires agencies to obtain OMB approval of this information for collection. And in the 1999 information collection budget, we list agency violations. These occur primarily when agencies continue to use collections for which OMB approval has expired. And the lists are long. They are too long. And they indicate a substantial problem that we must address and resolve. And we are taking agency violations very seriously and we'll be working with the agencies and for, to improve compliance with the act. Information is vital to the government and provides its citizens with necessary services. And all the go all the, although the government has always depended on accurate and timely information, in today's complex, rapid-paced, globalized world, the ability to collect information and use the information to benefit citizens and improve service delivery is more critical than ever before. The 1999 ICB, the GAO report, the GAO testimony, and communications with your committee and your staff have pointed out some of the positive steps that have been taken and also some steps that we need to be take in order to reduce burden and ensure agency reporting accuracy. And we look forward to working in a partnership among OMB, the agencies, the Congress, and the public to achieve this important goal. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, we will have questions for you along with the rest of the panel. Our final panelist will be Mr. James White, who is the Director of Tax Policy and Administration Issues at the General Accounting Office. Mr. White, again, your full testimony will be put in the record. Feel free to summarize it for us today. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss management challenges facing the IRS. As you know, over recent years, IRS has faced criticism and increased congressional scrutiny over its inability to serve taxpayers and replace its antiquated information systems. Several key IRS program areas, such as accounts receivable, have been on our high-risk list of government programs susceptible to waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement. The increased congressional scrutiny culminated in the passage of the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998. In response, the Commissioner is leading a massive restructuring of the whole agency that focuses on business and information systems modernization. My statement makes three points, summarized in bullets beginning on page two, that illustrate the management challenges posed by this kind of modernization effort. First, 
One challenge for successful business modernization, that is modernization that results in significant improvements in the service provided to taxpayers, will be developing a balanced performance measurement system and then aligning those performance measures from the top of the organization down to the frontline staff. IRS's history shows the dangers of imbalanced performance measures that rely too heavily on enforcement statistics. IRS is seeking to develop more appropriate measures of business results, customer satisfaction, and employee satisfaction. An example of a business results measure is voluntary compliance, but developing such a measure will be a challenge. At this time, only limited data exists on voluntary compliance. Developing a reliable measure of voluntary compliance will require addressing concerns about the burden doing so places on some taxpayers. The new performance measures must also be aligned throughout IRS. This will require new employee evaluation systems and training, including orientation training for all 100,000 employees and managers, leadership courses for managers and executives, and technical training. Second. Successful systems modernization is essential to successful business modernization. IRS's systems modernization is essential because it is intended to implement IRS's modernized business practices. For example, modern systems would provide employees and taxpayers with current information about taxpayer accounts. IRS has developed a blueprint for systems modernization, but did so before the current restructuring initiative. IRS intends to validate the blueprint in light of restructuring, working as a partner, in its words, with a systems integration contractor. However, we have said in the past that using contractors for systems development is no panacea. Succeeding at systems modernization will be a challenge because it depends on whether IRS can effectively partner with and manage its contractors. Third. The sheer magnitude of undertaking both business modernization and systems modernization will strain IRS's management and staff. Such an ambitious undertaking, along with the need to stay in business, makes the restructuring initiative a high-risk venture and one that will take years to implement. While undertaking both is ambitious and risky, there is no alternative. As I said above, successful systems modernization is essential to business modernization. In conclusion, IRS has equipped itself with a new mission statement that focuses on customer service. Business modernization holds promise for achieving this goal of improving service to taxpayers, but successful modernization will need to be sustained beyond the term of the current commissioner. That means dealing with challenges such as those that I have discussed, developing a balanced set of performance measures, aligning the organizational measures with the employee evaluation system, training 100,000 staff, validating the information systems modernization blueprint in light of restructuring, and effectively managing inf information systems contractors. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. White. Um, in fact, let me ask unanimous consent that we keep the record open 10 days, because I think Mr. Horn, who's not able to be with us for the conclusion of this, may have some questions specifically for you. Um, but similarly, if any of the other members of the two committees do, um, we'll get those to you in writing as well as the other panels. Let me ask uh, very quickly, um, Mr. Stevens, were you estimated, I think, that for 28 of the 872 violations of, of the law, on failing to, to get the paperwork approved before it was required of American citizens, that it cost about $3 billion. Um, were you able to, to get information from OMB on the cost of the others, either in the man hours um, that are associated with them, or otherwise make an estimate of the cost for all of those violations? Um, the information collection budget does not include uh, the hours that are associated with each of the, with each of the violations, so it's not readily apparent from uh, uh, from their publication. Um, we did go back to OMB and ask, um, for, ask for the hours of burden that were associated with the Department of Agriculture's um, uh, information uh, collection violations, and they provided that readily. Um, and we made some extrapolations from that. This, this, in general, the ones uh, that the 28 were drawn from were the largest collections of government. If you make some assumptions, um, that the Department of Agriculture is similar to other agencies um, and that the volume that we had there was, would be similar across government. 
Um, we figured there were about 50,000 hours for each of those collections, and it would add about another billion dollars if we extrapolated that to the rest of the government. That's something of a stretch. It wasn't easy to do, but um, it would make it at about four billion instead of three billion. Additional, additional to the, to yes. the, three, so three to four, not an additional four on top of the three. Yes, because the. Um, the additional ones were from smaller collections than the okay. than the ones we looked at at first. So we're thinking we're looking at four billion dollars of additional costs. That, that would be a reasonable assumption based based on our. Uh, let me ask you, Ms. Lee, um, to respond to some of the the comments that Mr. Stevens had made. One, actually, just to start it off, has Vice President Gore been involved in the paperwork reduction activities of OMB in, in a supervisory role? In a day to today role, no. But in terms of reviewing the, the final outcomes and the general supervision? No. Uh, to, best, to the best of my knowledge, he ha he's not familiar with, you know, into this level of detail. Okay. Um, so that, well, we can come back to the recommendation. The, how do you respond and how does OMB respond to the criticism that they counted the hours for the illegal forms as reductions when in fact the forms were continuing to be uh, used by the agencies and four billion dollars of cost was imposed with great concern we, we don't want that to happen um, the information collection budget is a good planning tool and what we have realized by collecting this rather this is the second year we've had the detailed report, is that it has made agencies more aware of their commitments and more aware of the process, but it is not perfect, and we, we recognize we've got a long way to go. What we do want to do is accomplish the goals. And so does OMB have any plan to, to change its own operations so that those aren't double counted? I mean, it, it appears as if they reduce more paperwork than actually is reduced. If, if the form is no longer valid, and OMB says that's not a valid form anymore, so we're going to count it as a savings. But the agencies continue to use it. We did make corrections in the budget for the 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 information collection budget. We tried to correct the amount of those the collection for those items that had dropped off. And I know this is a discussion of programs and adjustments, but there is a correcting information in the budget, and we've tried to capture those. And we're looking for ways in the future to prevent that from happening, and then to act quickly should it happen and consider all these recommendations. Good, because I think it'd be important to have the bottom line number be accurate there. How about in response to the, the what Mr. Stevens said was perhaps even more troubling, the, the failure to be proactive in getting the agencies to implement the, regulatory, the paperwork reduction initiatives? The proactiveness, um, certainly we have desk officers who are each involved with agencies and we they do review the activities on a regular basis we've even discussed how how we can improve that and are looking at some of the recommendations that are before us here to see which one of those are readily implementable well let's look at some of the specifics that were in the written testimony uh, do, do you think it's a good idea that oira would in advance of the expiration um, notify the agency it's about to expire and and seek their action to correct that? They currently send out, on, I believe, on a quarterly basis, a list of, of regulations that are about to expire. And I think what we're talking out, up, about here is a little bit more aggressive follow-up. Okay. And then some of the others, it, when they find that one has expired, uh, will they, uh, they list publicly announce the agency is out of compliance, notify the budget side of OMB, uh, notify the vice president, um, and notify the Federal Register. Are those four good suggestions? Those are suggestions that we're looking at. How do we, how do we put these into the system? How mm -hmm. and when and at what phase? Okay, and, and let me ask you today, is that something that will be done? I expect it will be. Okay, because they seem like very common sense good suggestions to me. How about the comment um, that perhaps OIRA needs more employees, that, that there's been a reduction in the workforce um, not only on in President Clinton's watch, but prior to that, that perhaps we actually need to give you some additional staffing and resources to do all of these things. I was not at OIRA previously with the other headcount, and I know that the, the office is relatively small. It's about 40 yeah. people, and they do uh, do a turn a tremendous amount of regulatory review, et cetera. And I know that's a discussion that's ongoing with other committees as to what is the appropriate staffing. 
Well, just for, for our record today, is that a good suggestion from GAO that Congress should look at? I'm kind of in the uh, same as Ms. Rosati's vote. Is, uh, I don't specifically have a, my individual comment on that. I think we need to look at it as the agency at the whole and look at if we can do some of this reduction or we can look at other ways to simplify whatever and then align the appropriate personnel to that approach. Well, the other thing that this committee's recommended and when the agency hasn't wanted to increase personnel is to fence off some of the budget and say unless these things get done, you can't spend it in other places. So um, let me ask you to go back and we'll, we're holding the record open for 10 days and, and see if there's a, an official response from OMB on that question of whether we should increase the, the staffing. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Then the final one, and I'm going to then go over and vote, and Mr. Ryan will come and continue the, this part of the hearing. What about this idea of encouraging the vice president to, to take a more active day-to-day -day or at least supervisory role under his authority and under the executive order? Um, now, I'll share with you, I, I did work for a former vice president who was very active in that, and so my, it seems to me like a good idea. I, I think you can have different views coming from a vice president's office, but the institutional structure struck me as a good one where you had someone close to the president paying attention to these questions on paperwork and regulation. Mr. McIntosh, that's certainly a, a possibility, but I think as you've pointed out at this hearing, we've got some more staff work to do, and I think we need to do some of that and, and ensure that we've done the best we can before we uh, present this issue to the Vice President for his action. Okay. I and mean, certainly uh, anybody who's as busy as, as a Vice President and many things that on his plate, you need to make sure he was well staffed in doing that. and and. OIRIS did that for us when we were in the office of the Vice President. Um, let me ask one other quick question. Should Congress consider sanctions for either the agency or policy officials in an agency who, once they've gotten the notice that the paperwork's about to expire, knowingly violate the act and let it expire and then continue to collect those paperwork requirements from the public so that there's some teeth behind the requirement there? The, this sanction activity, again, I'm going, I'm going to leave that as to the Congress for their decision. I think as the administrative side of the House, we, we need to do a better job of aggressively following up on those activities and then present you with accurate results so you can properly make that decision. Mr. Stevens, let me ask you that question. Do, would GAO feel that that might be one way to strengthen the provisions of the Act? Um, well, it's certainly true there's no consequence of a violation now. You just get your, your, your collection published in a book, uh, your name's not attached to it, there's really no, uh, no adverse consequences at all. Um, and I would think it would be uh, reasonable to have that to be a performance element in the, uh, in, the, in the SES contract of the chief information officer, for example. Um, but I also think that it's, it's too early to give up on OIRA and its, uh, its, its role and its policing, its ability to use the pressures of the, of the budget and the, and the overall controls they have over agencies. Uh, we do have a mechanism in place. Um, I think uh, we should pr try to make that work before we impose a new one on top of it. Or maybe strengthen it that way in, in providing the incentive at the agency to cooperate with OIRA. Um, let me now have the committee stand in recess. Uh, Mr. Ryan told me he would be coming right back after the vote, and so he's the vice chairman, will continue. He may have some questions for you all on this panel. Um, if not, he'll move on to the next panel. Thank you very much. I do appreciate your coming today. Uh.
think we're reconvening right now. I'd like to start by asking Mr. Stevens uh, a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Stevens, can you tell me what OMB's, or excuse me, what GAO's recommendations are for improvements in OMB's management of the paperwork burden imposed on the public? Um, one, perhaps, uh, Mr. Ryan, would be to take a larger, more systemic view of the problem of information collection. Um, typically right now, uh, within the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, uh, the individual desk officers are uh, inundated with, in with individual in information collections. Uh, one of them we talked to said uh, she had 20 or 30 of them on her desk at the, t at the time we, we spoke to her. Um, and, and it's not hard to understand that they deal with these serially one by one um, and that, they're, that it's hard to take an overview of the, of the impact of that on the, uh, on the, the, the clientele of the agency, mm -hmm. uh, on the government, on the overall burden. And it seems to us that um, somehow taking a larger view of, of that, uh, that problem, dealing with these in, in larger aggregates, uh, could, be a, 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 could be a step forward. Um, Mr. McIntosh uh, also recounted some of the specifics in our statement, but those, uh, those have to do with, in, with dealing with individual violations of the Act, and we do have right. some suggestions there. And pr the problem there is that it's, it's just not very prominent. There are no real penalties or adverse consequences from violating the Act, and, and uh, some, some higher-level attention uh, to that could presumably be effective. How, how would you apply that? How would, what would your, if you had to rewrite the system, uh, how would you bring that higher level attention to that? Um, the reason that the, one, one of the basic reasons the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs is in the Office of Management and Budget mm -hmm. is because that is, to, is where the clout resides. The, the perception and the, the argument is that OMB can bring power, bring, uh, bring yeah. pressure to bear on agencies through its control of the budget process, through its control of, uh, of, of, of legislative clearance. Uh, and to our knowledge, that is not used very systematically um, within OMB, and we think that uh, closer relationships between OIRA and those budget examiners could presumably make a difference, particularly for agencies that are, that are endemically um, in violation. Have you looked at OIRA in prior administrations and witnessed that OIRA had had a strengthened role, say, in, in past administrations in the 80s versus the role OIRA plays now? Does OIRA seem to be playing second fiddle versus its role in prior administrations? Are there models that we've had employed within OMB that have strengthened OIRA that you ought think we ought to go back and take a look at? Or what are some structural things we should do with OIRA to elevate their importance, their, their involvement within OMB? Have you taken a look at the, the past? Models. Well, we have looked at OIRA since it was uh, right. since it was first put together, and we've done many studies that have over 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 the years. It used to be a larger organization than it is now in terms of staff, um, and we have uh, not recommended directly, but pointed mm -hmm. uh, in our testimonies to the effects of of uh, the attrition that they they've suffered there. Um, it's also true that I think that OIRA has been uh, more dictatorial with regard to agencies in the past. It controlled more, um, and it, and uh, they took some negative, uh, they got some negative reaction sure. to that. And I think Congress at one point uh, has, has had the point of view that OIRA should, uh, should not be so active as it has before. So th they, have, they have a balancing role. I think it's, it's not as strong as it used to be, but was, perhaps it, 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 Was that more style or structure? You know, the old, I remember the old OIRA as one that was just how you described. Was that because of the style of the leadership within OIRA, or was that a difference in structure within the agency? And was the attrition that we've seen within OMB with respect to OIRA um, s s much more significant within the rest of the attrition within the agency? Uh, was OIRA singled out, do you believe, in the last six years um, over other, other cutbacks within the agency? Well, actually, since OIRA is a statutorily based agency, I think it was protected somewhat mm -hmm. from the restructuring that the rest <clears throat> of the management functions in OMB have, have, have gone through. So I don't think it's been differentially affected, but it, uh, but it certainly is smaller. It's certainly, uh, uh, in our perception there, uh, people are not sitting around uh, with, with spare time on their hands. Yeah. They're extremely busy. They work very, very hard, and, and uh, we respect that. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Stevens. Mrs. Lee, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Um, 
given that the IRS accounts for nearly 80 percent of the total government-wide paper, paperwork burden on the American public, uh, given that fact, what changes did OMB make in IRS's proposed information collection budget? Mr. Ryan, I don't have the specifics on, on IRS, but I'd be glad to get them for you. That'd be great if you, would, if you do that. I'd appreciate it. Uh, it's my understanding the IRS did not identify any specific expected paperwork reduction accomplishments in FY2000. Uh, can you comment on that? Can you comment on why OMB accepted that? Well, I think Mr. Rosati discussed it um, in, rather in, in detail and, and committed to look at could they make additional reductions and try to balance the burden and the benefit for the changes in the tax code. Okay. In your role, though, it, uh, wouldn't it what I'm trying to get at is we heard Mr. Rosati's testimony with respect to paperwork reduction. OMB, uh, it is OMB's role to find other recommendations, to maybe to check on the work. Why hadn't OMB come up with a separate recommendation uh, for the IRS? Or is there, is there a history there that you can shed some light onto this, why there was no uh, recommendation? I don't believe there's a specific history, but I would be glad to get okay. the, the details for you. Okay. Um, one, one thing I did want to uh, quick ask you is since the HHS is expected to levy the third largest paperwork burden on the American public, uh, why did OMB accept uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, the act of not identifying any specific expected paperwork reduction accomplishments in, in 99? There, too, we're working with HHS. They have some, some pluses, and the, the that is in many cases because they have some key legislative initiatives. They have the Prescription Drug Marketing Act. They have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Mm -hmm. They have the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act and the Medicare Reform Initiatives. So those added burden, and now we're trying to, again, balance that burden and, and responsibility and find out what reductions can be made to offset the increased burden. So we shouldn't pass so many laws, you're saying? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'll leave that up to you, sir. I am kidding. <laughs> um, did, did they get enough questions through? I don't care. Oh, uh, Mrs. Lee, I have a question from Chairman Horn. Um, Chairman Horn asked uh, Commissioner Rosati about the President's failure to submit nominations for the IRS Oversight Board. Uh, Mr. Rosati did not know why no names had been submitted. Uh, do you? No, sir, I don't, but I again would be glad to look into that and tell you if we have any nominations. If you could, and if you could give that to Chairman Horn, I, I sure would appreciate that. Okay. And I'd like to ask Mr. White the same question. What? Oh, uh, this is another question from Chairman Horn. Uh, could you touch on why the IRS has failed on its efforts in the past, and if you feel this effort is proceeding in a way that is different? Uh, in terms of its efforts to modernize? Yes. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. In, in terms of modernization. Um, I, I think that what IRS is doing right now is a much larger effort than it's attempted in the past. One of the points that we've made uh, repeatedly in our past work is that, for example, systems modernization, which is an area in which IRS has um, had a number of problems over the past years and wasted a lot of money, uh, that needs to be done in an integrated fashion with business process modernization. And the current commissioner uh, is operating that way. They're in a planning phase right now on that where they're trying to do both. It's, a, it's the ambitious. Right, Ms. Hoffe, we'd love to hear from you first. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for asking me to testify before this subcommittee. I am here because I am a patriotic American. I don't really want to be here. But when a staff member of the United States Congress calls and asks you to appear in these august halls and participate in this process, you feel it is your duty as an American to respond. So I'm here to tell you my story. May I first express to you that I am not a tax protester, not by any stretch of the imagination. This is not even about paying taxes. Now, I have been a tax activist at the state level. I have a history of that. I um, organized an initiative at the state level to require a two-thirds majority for tax increases in Arizona. I worked on that with Congressman John Shattuck. It was successful. I have other of those types of successes to my credit. 
But this is not even about that. This is about the fact that I am a taxpayer. I am self-employed. Now I have two assets which enable me to make a living as a self-employed consultant. Number one is my knowledge and my abilities. Number two is time. The IRS has zapped a whole lot of my time over the recent past. And there's a third thing. It's my creative energies and my enthusiasm for what I do. And that may be an even greater loss to the IRS. Now this past weekend, upon returning home from a grueling business trip, a very difficult trip indeed, the latest communication appeared in our mailbox from the Internal Revenue Service. Now when you see that envelope, you immediately panic, your blood pressure goes up, you go, oh my gosh, what now? You have this heavy sigh, and then the what now was an unexpected bill from the IRS. It was a bill, when I opened it, for 16 cents. Now can you imagine that? They sent this bill in a, with a 33 cent stamp at a cost of how much time and computer time and staff time? And I don't even know how you write a 16 cent check. And I have to respond and take my time and my 33 cent stamp in order to comply. This is just another invasion of my valuable time. But more than that, what is so annoying is this invasion of my precious few moments in my home with my family to deal with this after a long and grueling business trip. Now, how did this come to happen? Well, a few weeks ago, I received a bill, an unexpected bill from the IRS for about $54, which they said I owed from an underpayment of my daughter's 1996 taxes when she was 18 years old and still living at home. Now, when you get a bill for $54 from the IRS, you do what any normal person would do. You pay it because you don't have time to take out of your life to even look into why you're getting the $54 bill. I still don't know why, but I paid it. Now, you know, it would have cost me hundreds of dollars in time, let alone my enthusiasm and energies in order to even look it out. So I just paid it. Now that latest example, the $54 and the 16 cents may seem very trivial, but it came to me at a, t at a time that came after a very grueling experience that I had over the last year with the IRS. Here is what happened. After an examination of my husband's and my 1996 tax return, which took about four months, an amount we owed as a result was agreed upon. It was settled upon. A large portion of that amount was agreed that it was deductible. It's just that I paid those expenses in December of 96, and the IRS said they really belong deducted in 97, so they were deductible. But what I needed to do was write a very large check to the IRS and then get my accountant to refile 97, and a large portion of that check would come back to me. So December 3rd of that last year, I wrote a large check to the IRS for the precise amount. We hand-delivered it date stamped it in at the IRS Phoenix office. Then our accountant redid the 1997 return as had been suggested and it requested a refund. Now a month or so later we received a bill from the IRS. It was for the amount of the check that we had written in December. Now it said in there if you've already paid your tax you can ignore this notice. Well we'd already paid it, date stamped it in, we had the proof, we ignored the notice. A couple of weeks later comes the certified letter from the IRS with the words, we may seize your paycheck, bank account, auto, other property. We can file a notice of federal tax lien, plus there was $200 in penalty and interest for a check we had written. We proved it. We showed them the date stamp. Uh-uh. The burden was on us. We had to prove it to them by going to our bank, getting a copy of both sides of the check, and, and then so that they could find out where they'd misapplied our money, to whose account. More time lost, more creative energy spent. Eventually they were satisfied, I think, up to this point, I understand. But then came the next blow, that certified letter. Another one came in the mail, denying the refund for 1997. So now I, I, I realize I'm just about out of time, but I would like to go into, I have one employee up until about a month ago, I had one employee. I don't have any employees right now. 
So I hope that you'll give me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the payroll tax burden for one employee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hay. Um, certainly, when the questioning, I would we'll make sure that we get that into the record. Our second witness for this uh, uh, project is Ms. Kay Whitehead. Uh, Ms. Whitehead, uh, who is familiar to this committee. She's testified before in a field hearing and here in Washington. Um, and I appreciate you coming from Indiana. It's a pleasure to have you here once again. And your entire testimony will be submitted into the record. Uh, and feel free to summarize it today before us. Thank you. I am a farmer from Delaware County, Indiana. And on our third generation family farm, we grow corn, soybeans, wheat, hay, and hogs. I would like to thank the subcommittee for this opportunity, but let me say that I am very concerned that our family will have the opportunity to be a fourth generation farm. There's no question that American agriculture will enter the next millennium as the world's leader in food production, but will we occupy this same position in another 10 years? If we don't want American agriculture to slip, and I really don't think that is the intent, we need to change thinking in government. We've got to quit tying farmers in knots with ill-conceived, costly regulation. We've got to stop imposing sanctions on U.S. agricultural trade. We can't give developing nations a pass on restrictions that would be imposed by a global climate treaty. I bring all of this to your attention in order that you may better understand the frustration of producers out there in rural America as we attempt to abide by the law but it keeps changing and growing before the ink is dry on the paper. Between EPA and IDEM, which is Indiana's version of EPA and every state has one, agriculture is being driven from this country at an alarming pace. Is this the true intent of Congress and this administration? Just as an example, Indiana has had since 71 statutes for confined feeding operations. In the 1998 inspections completed by IDEM, still utilizing that old guideline process of 91, the results show that only 2.4% of the inspections conducted revealed significant and or repeated problems. These results prove that Indiana producers are doing a very good job of protection of water resources and thus public health. In Indiana, we have a zero discharge requirement. It is a strong performance standard, but it is working. But recent actions show me that, there, that agencies and government are more worried about developing regulatory procedures and paperwork than accomplishing results. On March 9th of 1999, EPA and USDA presented their unified national strategy for animal feeding operations. I was present at the meeting in March of 99 in which an official from EPA presented this document to an IDEM rulemaking meeting. The official stated that this program was 95% voluntary and only 5% mandatory. However, after listening to what he actually said, the fact is, if a producer does not develop a CNMP, which is a Comprehensive Nutrient Management Plan, and a, obtain an NPDES, Non-Point Discharge Elimination System, which is a permit to discharge, but agriculture would not be allowed to do so, the stormwater exemption currently provided for in the Clean Water Act would not be honored. Indiana producers, as, to, as do producers in many other states, currently must provide by law documentation to obtain an approval before they can build a confined feeding facility. Part of that documentation is a manure management plan, which is an MMP. The question was specifically asked by this rulemaking meeting of that official of whether the current approval process that producers must go through in Indiana and the current MMPs that we must provide would meet EPA's needs. The answer was an emphatic no. So producers will now be required to complete another level of bureaucratic paperwork. And this will not only be applied to new facilities, but existing ones as well. Existing operations that already have approvals will now have to meet the new improved government regulations at two levels. Then to add more fuel to the fire, I as a producer cannot provide my own CNMP and the EPA USDA document specifically states that it must be completed by a public official or a certified private party. Another cost that makes no sense. I will be the user. I will implement the plan and yet I will have no ownership of that plan. And it will cost me to obtain this plan, which is probably a standard 
prescribed document that will not consider any of the assets of my current practices on our farm. My current manure management plan was developed by me and is flexible to allow our farm to incorporate new technology into our management procedure. The new plans are very prescriptive and imprisons our management into today's technology. It is an enforceable, immovable plan. USDA will require me to do uh, additional record keeping, records to indicate the quantity of manure produced, how the manure was utilized, in, including where, when, so forth, or the amount supplied. We have no way to pass this cost along. Farmers are price takers, not price makers. Although not a solution to the additional cost of this requirement, the first thing that farmers are going to be forced to do is to increase in size, and that, that is to spread the cost out over more units. I'm not opposed to record keeping. I think records make good sense. We do that on our farm. It's part of good business practice. But mandates by the government to regulate management is unacceptable. In the essence of time, I'm going to come to a conclusion here, and there's just one thing I want to know from this committee and from Congress and this administration. As a farmer, I want to know. I'd, I'd like an answer to, as to the intent and the direction of this administration. If everyone is intent on providing more jobs in the, re in the regulatory arena, arena by continuing to create more costly regulatory burdens for agriculture, I need to know that. My family needs to know that so that we can get out of this business while there's still, still some equity left in our farm and before the fourth generation becomes too involved. Perhaps we could all get jobs in the regulatory arena. It does seem that's quickly the becoming the future of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whitehead. Let me say it will be the intention of this committee to make sure we hold back the regulators so that you all can continue farming. Uh, same thing for small businesses such as uh, Ms. Hayes. Um, we are up against a large regulatory entity here in Washington. EPA is only one of many, but we're doing the best here in Congress to hold them in check. Um, let me now turn to our fourth witness, Mr. William Lindsay, who is the President of Benefit Management and Design Incorporated of Denver, Colorado. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee, uh, the Subcommittee on Natural Resources and Regulatory Affairs and the Government Management Information and Technology Subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to appear before you. Uh, my firm is an insurance broker and an employee benefit consultant. Uh, I'm also a board member of the National Small Business United, the nation's oldest small business advocacy organization. Foremost, I want to thank Representative McIntosh and Representative Horn, as well as others, for their leadership and understanding of the serious dilemma the paperwork represents for America's 23.3 million plus small businesses. I applaud you and support you in this effort to bring sanity to the paperwork requirements we face. By their very nature, unnecessary federal regulation and paperwork burdens and discriminates against small businesses. Without large staffs of accountants, benefits coordinators, attorneys, personnel administrators, etc., small businesses are often at a loss to implement or even keep up with the overwhelming paperwork demands of the federal government. Big corporations have already built these staffs into their operations and can absorb new requirements that could be very costly and expensive for a small business owner. If you ask any all small business owner their opinion of the required paperwork, the responses overwhelmingly will indicate that there's redundancy and excessiveness in the filing process. Duplication is also a serious concern. Agencies must seek ways to eliminate the duplication of paperwork. We have two national public policy issues that are very important to this Congress, and that is first to provide more insured workers in the workforce, and second of all, to increase retirement savings among America's workers. My experience with paperwork dealing with pensions and health care is, as you might expense, expect, extensive, and I'll share with you a couple of personal examples of how uh, federal paperwork um, impedes these two national um, um, priorities. Atop my list is the unnecessary paperwork and burdensome requirements uh, critical to uh, ha health insurance requirements. In small businesses, virtually every health plan requires some degree of employee contribution toward premium cost. The law allows employers to establish so-called flexible benefit plans or Section 125 plans so employees can make their contribution on a pre-tax basis. This tax saving feature reduces the net cost to the employee and enables the employer to increase employee enrollment as a result. It's an obvious positive for both sides. In my experience, virtually all small businesses structure their plans to operate on this basis. There's no reason not to. 
The IRS requires that employers file a plan document and a summary plan description along with for, uh, IRS Form 5500 at year end in order for such premium payments to qualify on a tax preferred status. Failure to form, excuse me, failure to file Form 5500 can result in a penalty of up to $1,000 a day without a limit. The Form 5500 was designed for pension tax re uh, reporting. It is over six pages long with 10 schedules and according to the IRS takes 11 hours to complete. I don't think I even have to comment on how short-sighted their time estimates are. Yet the form is not intended for this purpose and the IRS does virtually nothing with the forms that are filed. As a result, this may be the single greatest abuse by small businesses in America. They simply don't file the form, but by so doing expose themselves to significant penalties by the IRS. Another example is the very complicated area of IRS Notice 9852, and this is a brand new requirement recently published by the IRS. It requires that all 401k plans and other forms of retirement plan with employee contributions provide employees with an annual notice of their rights under the plan. This notice duplicates virtually every point in the summary plan description that the Department of Labor requires plan trustees to provide eligible participants. Employers who fail to provide this annual notification stand the risk of being fined and possibly having their plan disqualified. If the summary plan description is a valid summary of employee rights, then I would ask, why is another notice, which is completely duplicative, uh, required to repeat what employees have, have already been given? This poses a real threat for small businesses attempting to establish retirement plans. It is more work and also lays a trap to catch them if they fail to provide this annual notice. As Congress and the administration work toward increasing the abysmal savings rate in this country and making it easier for small businesses to provide retirement plans to their employees, doesn't this paperwork requirement run completely counter to that? I would suggest that IRS Notice 9852, all it does is add another layer of gotcha uh, in the process and serves as a barrier and a disincentive for small business owners. There are two very important pieces of legislation that the House passed earlier this year. Uh, H.R. 439, the Paperwork Elimination Act of 1999, and H.R. 391, the Paperwork Reduction Amendments, uh, sponsored by co uh, 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 Chairman uh, McIntosh, that will be significant in our, our efforts to improve compliance and reduce the requirements uh, that are fostered on small businesses. Another critical step is to increase the dialogue among the agencies to get them to be more understanding and more uh, responsive to the concerns of small businesses. And if we have time during the questions, Mr. Chairman, I have an idea in that area. The, Marriott, the message I finally want to leave with you is that paperwork burdens are excessive and they are dragging our nation's small businesses down. It is imperative that the federal government reduces in a real and tangible fashion the paperwork that requires America's 23.3 million small businesses. Legislation and, and agency initiatives are good starts, but the real incredible government-wide drive to make this process more workable is needed and needed now. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Lindsay, and certainly uh, couldn't agree with you more about the needed reforms in legislation. Um, look forward to talking with you about those other costs and disincentives that are included in there. Our final witness on this panel is Mr. John Nicholson, who is the owner of Company Flowers from Arlington, Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson, for coming today. It's my pleasure, and thank you for inviting us. Uh, uh, you're pursuing a, a very important but uh, rather dry or drab topic of paperwork and procedures and taxes. And so I brought along some flowers to try to brighten up the scene a bit. Thank you. Our shop uh, called Company Flowers, which is known around here as the best little flower shop in all of Washington, to do a little bit of an advertisement, is uh, like many other mom and pop shops, family run. My wife is the chief designer and flower purchaser who goes down to the wholesale markets at uh, five o'clock in the morning uh, hand-picked the very finest blossoms. My daughter runs our shop and is constantly arranging our giftware and, and the finest in customer service. And I handle the books, the promotion, and other tasks that most of our uh, people in our shop care not to do, such as testifying before Congress. Uh, the task before us today is to uh, explain how the burdens of tax collection, which is, of course, never a happy process, have multiplied and become especially burdensome. And let me point out three general areas that I wanted to bring to your attention. Number one is the attitude of the enforcers. 
Number two is the difference among the different business filers between small and large corporations. And three, the con congressional responsiveness to special pleaders, which I think has been mentioned earlier. Regarding the attitude of the enforcers, our business grosses less than a million dollars a year, but we spend close to $9,000 on CPA costs alone. Now, that doesn't include the major costs of collecting the accounting data that leads to the numbers that the CPA uses. But if I make a mistake, or I decide not to pounce on each and every little detail during any one month, it can affect my pocketbook, or it can affect my bank's pocketbook, but the greatest fear I have is that the IRS is going to come after me for some simple mistake. That's why I've interposed my CPA between me and the IRS filings. I respect his interpretation of the IRS rules, which I have difficulty understanding. And while there are times that I'm less than thrilled by what he asks or says must be done, at least I'm able to deal with someone who doesn't possess that police mentality. The presumption of guilt until proven otherwise, is not the case except with the IRS. The second topic, difference among business filers, arises because I compile my own employee income tax reports each month. If the business were larger, I'd ask for people more skilled than I to do so, but the reality is I can't afford it. Bigger businesses can afford, uh, can afford their own bean counters, and they can plead their cases before Congress more readily as well. Because the big company managers are comfortable with procedures necessary for nationwide operations, they are at peace, generally, with IRS objectives or activities reflecting its large-scale nationwide activities. But what's sensible for the big guys doesn't often make sense for us little do-it-at-home types. The third major topic I wanted to bring to you is the congressional responsiveness to special pleaders. It may be not a very popular topic up here, but the reality is that our tax code is riddled with loopholes. While we may laugh at the Tax Lawyers Relief Act that often arises whenever there's a change in the code, the fact is those tax lawyer fees create business costs that must be passed along to consumers. Small business owners like myself can't afford those special pleadings, and I'm not sure that I'd be comfortable asking for any anyway. But what's the solution? Well, while some changes in law might result from some beneficial tinkering here and there, I think what's ultimately required is a major change, if not indeed scrapping the tax code. I'm a member of the National Federation of Independent Business, and NFIB has taken the lead in calling for an end to the tax code as we know it today. I'm also a member of my florist uh, association, FTD, and it's a leading group of florists who provide your $8 billion in flowers from neighborhood flower shops. They, too, have suggested, let's scrap the code and get on with something better, more equitable, and most importantly, most simple. We need to dump the tax code and find a better way. Exemptions aren't the answer. Revision is. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you. And, uh, the momentum for that sentiment, I think, builds every year as the code becomes more and more complex. Um, certainly, I share it with you. Let me ask um, each of you, actually, uh, some basic questions for the record. What, what are your estimates for the total number of hours and dollars you spend annually, either as individuals or in your small businesses, to comply with the government paperwork requirements? If, if you've got a ballpark estimate of how many days a year, out of your year it takes, or how many hours a, a week. Uh, that's helpful for us to get an idea of the magnitude. Uh, Mr. Nicholson, I'll just start with you and go down the... I was just thinking, um, um, it probably is at least, it's at least a day and a half a month, so figure that out. Uh, you know, maybe some more, but, but that's about right. And then on top of that, you mentioned an accountant's bill for both. An accountant's right. bill, and, and right. Um, Mr. Lindsay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would estimate just, I was just doing the same calculation in my head. Our, our bill for our CPA and our tax attorney is about um, 95, going to be about $9,500 this year. Uh, and the amount of time, I would say 
uh, we have a bookkeeper um, who spends uh, time doing this, but I would guess that it's probably uh, closer to two days a month just in terms of paperwork and, and filing and other related requirements. Plus, I forgot a payroll service that we also hire uh, to be able to do the tax reporting and all of the uh, uh, tax filing uh, from uh, employees um, and the deductions on their wages. So that would be two days of your time and then a full-time employee? Uh, a full-time employee and then an outside service in addition to the accountant and the attorney. And we're only a firm of nine people. Nine. Wow. Uh, Ms. Hoffey, and in fact, share with us your, your story about the employee that you had. Okay. Also. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I couldn't even estimate, but I would like to make the point of one of the aspects of time that isn't even reflected when you're talking about how much time to do the paperwork is the time spent worrying about the paperwork. That, that wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and makes you lie there for two hours worrying about it. That's the part of time that's not reflected in any government report. And it's real. And it's a burden on our whole way of life, our whole economy. Um, but anyway, I'll just give you a, a thumbnail sketch about uh, the payroll tax burden. To have one employee, which I had up until a couple of months ago, and believe me, I'm rethinking if I ever want to do that again. Um, the filing of a payroll tax on a monthly basis. Now, I used to have to do it on a quarterly basis, and I was very interested to see, to hear uh, the commissioner of the IRS say that now for many small businesses, it's back to filing on a quarterly basis. This I did not know. Of course, when I used to file on a quarterly basis and they changed the rules and made me change over to a monthly basis, they informed me of this fact. Um, so I don't know that I'm going to be, I'll, I'll ask, do I get to switch over to quarterly now or not? But I'll just give you an example of the notices because of my monthly reports that I've received in the last month. On March 15th, I got an IRS notice saying I had a credit balance in this one employee payroll account of $571, asking me how do you want us to handle it. On March 22nd, about a week later, I got a notice saying, actually, you owe us $28.25 in this employee account. Same day, March 22nd, another notice, same mail. You actually, you owe us $548.56 on this same employee's payroll account. On April 5th, I got a notice saying, no, you owe us $431.60. None of these notices seem to match up with one another in any way. I have to take the time to sort it out. Another time loss is totally on the horizon for me as I try to figure out, are these my mistakes? Are these the IRS mistakes? Perhaps they're just the result of the fact that the tax code is such a mess, even they can't figure it out. I don't know. But that's the result for a person that has had one employee. Did, did you get those notices after you no longer had the employee? Or um, was the employee still with you? Yes, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So you weren't obligated to make any payments at that point? Well, but these were for you know, a month Previous or two. It, when, when you mess something up, it takes them several months to go back to it and then you get the notice about something that maybe is 90 days or 100 days old. So it, the paperwork from them takes a long time to get to you. Back to you. You uh, have to respond quickly, though. <laughs> Mrs. Whitehead. Yes. Um, I um, estimated, I had an economist from Purdue uh, work with me and we estimated the additional cost to our operation just for the regulatory paperwork. This doesn't include any bookkeeping or IRS. And that uh, would be as high as $2 a head. Now that doesn't mean anything to you. $2 a head per animal we produce. But let me give it to you in these terms. Now in a normal year, pork producers uh, receive anywhere from 2 to $8 per head profit on that animal. So if you took an average of $6 a head, I'm uh, looking at spending up to 30% of my profits just for the regulatory burden that will, are implemented on to me by both the state government and uh, national government. When you look, you ask specifically for time uh, committed, and I tried to do a little bit of background on this. Our, in our operation, we spend anywhere from 20 to 25 hours a week on total burden of paperwork. Now that does include both IRS and that's I try to include everything. Now some weeks it's it's much higher than that. It almost doubles. But um, and, and how many are there in, in your family working on the, the farming operation? We have a family farming operation. There's my husband uh, and myself right now. Our son is the 
junior at Purdue hoping to come back to the farm, but he's uh, involved in, in part of that. And then we do have uh, three employees besides. So we... Um, uh, so 25 hours out of a, a, essentially a five-person full-time operation right. goes towards filling out paperwork per each Correct. week. So almost a, a more than a half time per of employee. Well, now on the farm we work a f <laughs> more than 40 <laughs> hours a week. Longer than 40, yes. But um, I hope that answers your question. It does, and, and it's especially striking on the two dollar a head when you think about current prices or prices the way they have been in the last six months, where you're much below the cost of production. I think it reached as low as 16, 17 dollars a head, wasn't it? Uh, some down to eight. Some eight. markets were coded. I mean, and, and if two dollars. Uh, cost goes to just the government paperwork for environmental and other social regulation uh, it tells you exactly how much burden there is for the And what's farmer. so frustrating is when they do inspections they find that there's very little problem mm -hmm. and yet the burden increases. Um, let me turn now to my colleague Mr. Ryan who is the vice chairman of the committee and ask him if he has any questions for this panel. Yes. This is Whitehead, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. You said you do hogs, corn, soybeans, and what else? Wheat. I I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you're having a tough year. Uh, the commodity prices are an all-time low. So your hog prices, you're saying on your hogs, $2 a head? Are those contract hogs? Are you? No, sir. We're an independent producer. Oh, geez. You, you must be well below break-even then with that. And that, that is $2 of additional cost. That is probably not even taken out of your profit from this past year. Would that be correct? There was no profit this last right. year in hogs. So that's two dollars of additional cost that on the losses you incurred on your hogs today from the paperwork burden. That's correct. That's correct. Just the regulatory arena. Yes. Well, well some some of the things, and I'll digress just for a second. I'm I have a strong concern about rural America. I hope one day your son, who's a junior at Purdue, can come back to the family farm. But it's my concern that what we're doing here at the federal government are pushing the next generation of farmers into the cities to work at banks, to work at businesses, great, wonderful traits, wonderful professions. But we are pushing the next generation of farmers out of farming. And I think specifically you can point to the regulatory burden and the tax burden. We've talked about the regulatory burden in your testimony. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about the tax burden that is pushing the family farmer out of business, that is consolidating farms, and that is pushing the next generation of children who grow up on farms away from being able to run their family farms. What specifically are the tax provisions in the federal tax code that you think are the most onerous ones facing your farm? Well, the first that's going to jump to my mind, and, and I don't profess to be an expert about all the provisions because uh, we spend about $10,000 a year on accountant, like most of the others have mentioned here, but is the inheritance tax burden. It, it's very difficult for uh, farmers to pass along anything to the next generation because they have to sell it to pay the taxes. And um, like I say, we are uh, price takers, not price makers. So the cost of our production has nothing to do with what we receive for our product. But that would be the number one tax that uh, stands out for me uh, as far as uh, attempting to provide for the next generation. So when you hear people say that we have to keep the estate tax in place, it must exist in law because it gets after rich people, uh, you just reject that notion. Uh, absolutely. Um, one thing that we did do in the, in the Congress here is to try and get income averaging back on on a permanent basis. Is income averaging something that's helping you weather this burden a little bit, especially when you had such a bad year in hogs, looking at a bad year in soybeans? Does income averaging help you? Uh, yes, that, that was, a, was a vital tool, and I'm sure that uh, you've seen um, or will get the results of having implemented a great deal of those this year. One thing I was surprised about that, though, uh, because we're going to utilize that tool this year, is that it, does, it doesn't automatically happen with the filing. You have to utilize your accountant yeah. for uh, more procedures so that you can uh, attain the uh, form to uh, income average, so it's a whole new procedure. That's exactly what I was getting at. So income averaging, which allows you to write your losses off over a longer period of time, uh, how is that compliance? Is, are you saying that you have to get more paperwork burdens involved, you have to get more fees to your accountant to try and get income averaging on your books so you can try and, and release the pressure that you're hitting this year? Uh, is this 
adding a tremendous amount of cost. You know uh, quantitatively how much more you have to pay for an accountant to help you get your income averaging lined up? Well, you know, don't misunderstand me. I appreciate the tool. It's good mm -hmm. for agriculture mm -hmm. because we have to deal with the weather and a lot of other factors that many other businesses do not have to deal with. However, I was very surprised when my uh, filing was completed in, in agriculture, March 1 is our filing date instead of April 15th, when uh, there was no uh, attachment about income averaging. And I specifically asked my accountant, and he said, oh, well, that has to be done totally separately. It's a whole new document. I'll get that done when uh, ap April 15th passes. So that's a, that'll be another uh, set of costs to, um, to go about uh, providing or applying for a tool that I thought should have come with the provided for in the original filing. Why does it have to be so complicated? It's a good tool, yeah. but why does it have to be so complicated? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Whitehead. Mr. Nicholson, I wanted to ask you, you touched a little bit on scrapping the code, and I think uh, Mr. McIntosh and I are both co-sponsors of legislation uh, to, to have a date certain in law whereby we would sunset the tax code. So Congress, the administration, would know when the, sun, when the tax code expires, and we would have to replace it or extend the existing tax code at that date certain. Let's suppose we do pass this bill that does set a date certain in the future. What are some ideas that you've thought of? What, what do you think would be the best way to replace the current existing tax code? Well, there are several proposals that have kicked around, and, and you're more familiar with them than I am. Um, I can say one principle that I think is overriding and more important than anything else is simplicity. You're not going to get general public support for whether it's a flat tax or whether it's you know a value added tax or whatever variations come down the pike you're not going to get public support unless it's simple and that is you know cardinal rule number one whatever one is best you guys know a lot better than i do but but simplicity ought to be a guiding doctrine absolutely no matter what kind of thank you that's very helpful S going on that point miss hoffay i'd like to ask you a quick question were you here when, uh, when Mr. Rosati uh, gave his testimony? Yes, sir. Um, commenting on the issues of simplicity, it sounds like your, your experience with the IRS is anything but simplicity. Uh, what were your impressions of his testimony? Did you feel, as a taxpayer, adequately assured that the IRS is doing everything within their means to make sure that we have a simpler tax collection system, that the IRS is responding to the problems that we have out here, problems such as yours. What was your reaction to his testimony? Were your concerns allayed? And could you just comment on that? Mr. Ryan, I think my concerns could best be expressed by his comment about the fact that he sends out a, sur a survey to a representative sample of people who have encountered the IRS over the past year. I was the recipient of one of those independent surveys from an independent survey it's research more paperwork. company. <laughs> I, I was pleased to get it. I filled it out. I vented on that paperwork. I told the paperwork exactly, you know, it says, information, you know, put your comments here after you filled in all Did the boxes. Did they give boxes. you enough space on the comment it's form? not this big, but boy, I wrote big and extended it on another piece of paper. And then when I was finished, Mr. Ryan, I looked at it and I tore it up and I threw it in the trash. I did not mail it back in because for me, Mr. Ryan, the Internal Revenue Service seems to be such um, a police force. A, makes us feel like they're the secret service and they're all out to get us. I thought, I don't want to send this in and make myself a target. And so you were concerned what about feel, retribution? Sure, and that's what I feel about being here today. And I don't know if the other panelists feel the same. But I certainly do. That's why I said it. I'm here because it's my American duty to be here, but not because I want to be here. So I did not even fill in that survey. Hmm. I threw it away. Well, I hope that you won't have any problems associated with your testimony today. Uh, if you do, you'd be, make an excellent witness another time around. Uh, no, rest, rest assured, it is the policy of this committee, and we have had witnesses who have appeared before us then feel as if they've been harassed by an agency. And let me put it to the record that this committee then is very vigorous in pursuing that, and I will take it to the highest levels of this administration if it is your feeling that there has been any retribution, any of you, 
uh, for coming forward today because Congress needs this information in order to do our job. Uh, so we will definitely take steps and have in the past and gotten the problems corrected. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. Sir. Let me ask uh, or mention one other thing, if I may, yes. Mr. Ryan. The, beside you there, this stack of paper with the beautiful red ribbon around it is a stack of paper that the committee put together when we took forward the bill uh, that Mr. Lindsay mentioned, the uh, amendments to the Small Business Paperwork Reduction Act. That is the compilation of all the forms that we were aware of that it, a small business has to fill out when they hire a new employee over the first year of employment. And I'll put into the record the list of the 22 different forms that are there. Uh, they were provided to me by a small businessman in Muncie who asked his human resources person to just compile all of the different forms that she has to fill out every time they hire somebody. It is not not incredible to me, sadly, that people like uh, you, Ms. Hoffe, who make the decision every day not to hire people uh, because of that burden. And so it is one of the goals of this subcommittee to figure out which of those are duplicative, which we can get rid of, which we are not providing any benefit for the cost associated with it. And then a second point uh, that you addressed, which is also in that bill, is to relieve some of that worry factor by saying to a small businessman or a small businesswoman, if you happen to make a mistake in filling out all of that paperwork, we're going to allow you a chance to go back and correct it rather than come in and slap you with a fine. Uh, you mentioned, Ms. Hoffe, that there was a penalty uh, for one of the filings that, that the IRS had received or claimed they didn't receive when you'd made the payment. Similarly, many of the agencies also have penalties that they associate with not filling out the paperwork correctly or not keeping the logs correctly on your place of employment. Very simple and seemed to me straightforward that we would allow small businessmen an opportunity to correct it. So you put the government on the side of the business coming in and pointing out errors and then giving them a chance to correct it. My experience is that the vast majority of small businessmen and farmers in this country want to comply with all of these rules and regulations. They find them to be a headache. Uh, but in the same way you expressed, Ms. Hoffe, it, they view it as a duty, essentially, and, and they're law-abiding citizens. I was shocked when some of the colleagues in, in the House floor came in and said, but if you do that, you allow people, criminals, to get off the hook. Um, their view of the America's small businessmen and small businesswomen is that they're potential criminals. Our view is that they're decent people trying to get a job done, trying to hire people, uh, and putting up with an enormous burden of paperwork put out by the federal government to do that. So we're now working with the Senate to try to move that legislation forward, but I wanted to give you an update and show for those of us here exactly the, the magnitude of the paperwork that goes with each new employee that a small business hires in America. So I appreciate all of you coming today and sharing your testimony with us. I have no further questions for this panel. Mr. Ryan, yeah. do you? And truly do appreciate the, uh, your willingness to come here. Some of the things that you've pointed out will lead to questions directly to the IRS commissioner that w the committee will be sending forward. Um, I want to find out exactly what their policy is on some of the examples that you brought forward and to some of the other agencies. Um, and we'll in keep you informed on the further in information that we gather in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We have one more panel today, and I would uh, ask Ms. Ann Thompson-Reed to come forward. Uh, she is representing the United States Department of Agriculture and is the off chief office of, or office of the chief information officer. So I guess you are the chief information officer. Um, and let the record show that uh, Ms. Reed was sworn in along with the other witnesses at the beginning of the session share with us your testimony as we, the entire written testimony will be put into the record uh, so feel free to summarize key points for us today. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McIntosh, Mr. Ryan, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me here to share with you actions that are underway at the U.S. Department of Agriculture to reduce the paperwork burden on American citizens and particularly on farmers. Uh, with me today is Mr. Keith Kelly, who's the administrator of the Farm Service Agency. And with your permission, in addition to my formal statement, I would like to submit for the record a statement by Mr. Kelly as well. Seeing no objection, that statement will also be included in the record. 
USDA's diverse programs include food safety and inspection, food nutrition programs, programs to create jobs and support the infrastructure of rural America, natural resources and conservation, research and education, and of course, programs to support America's farmers. We are committed to streamlining program delivery while preserving fiscal integrity and preventing fraud, waste, and abuse. In fiscal year 1998, citizens spent approximately 84 million hours, and that does include the, the hours of the uh, associated with the expired collections, uh, providing information to USDA and fulfilling record-keeping requirements. By the close of fiscal year 2000, we estimate that we will reduce the actual paperwork burden to the public by approximately 6.2 million hours, which should bring the total to about 77.8 million hours. A key aspect of USDA's mission is to provide financial and technical assistance to farmers. This year, with the supplemental passed by Congress, USDA will provide about $31 billion in farm assistance. While we are deeply committed to helping farmers through this farm crisis, as with any financial institution, there are necessary requirements for assuring eligibility and for meeting our fiduciary responsibilities to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. In short, we want to be sure that the money goes where it's supposed to, to help farmers in need. The agencies which deliver programs through USDA's county-based service centers, the Farm Service Agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and three rural development agencies have a number of initiatives underway to reduce the paperwork burden on farmers and rural citizens. Projects underway include developing common geospatial maps and data that will allow greater sharing of land and crop information between partner agencies as well as external entities. An initiative to eliminate the need for customers to provide the same information more than one time by sharing it among agencies and providing electronic online information services to customers, employees, and partners of USDA. In fiscal year 1998, the Farm Service Administration's Farm Loan Program area initiated a comprehensive regulatory and program reengineering effort which will conclude in September of year 2002. FSA's loan making and servicing processes, as well as documents associated with both the direct and guaranteed loan programs, are being reviewed to eliminate redundant and unnecessary processes. This year, the application form for the guaranteed loan program was cut from 12 pages to six, and the amount of supporting documentation was, was reduced. Before the change, applicants spent an estimated two hours on the form. Today, it should take about 30 minutes. Recently implemented programs such as the Small Hog Operation Payment Program, the Dairy Market Loss Assistance Program, which began this week, and the Crop Loss Disaster Assistance Program have been deliberately structured to minimize paperwork requirements. In each of these, the forms should take about 15 minutes to complete, to complete and are available over the internet as well as through the county office. In fiscal year 1997, the Rural Housing Service streamlined the regulations for the single family housing program. By developing one consolidated regulation and revising the associated information collecting, the agency collectively reduced participants' paperwork burden by over a million hours. To obtain the full benefit from many of these projects, USDA must continue to invest in new technology. The current computer systems used by the agencies and the service centers are not interoperable and therefore present a real barrier to information sharing. The President's fiscal year 2000 budget proposal contains funds for accelerating the acquisition of the needing technology and continuing support for developing common business operations. Other significant accomplishments have been made in the food stamp program, in programs administered by the Grain Inspection Packers and Stockyards Administration, and by the Rural Housing Service. In conclusion, the Department will continue to work toward full compliance under the Paperwork Reduction Act and towards achieving the goals set by the Act and by the Office of Management and Budget. With your assistance, we will continue to move forward in delivering better customer service with a minimal paperwork burden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Reed, and we will include the full testimony into the record. Thank you. Um, let me ask you about these unauthorized paperwork um, information collections, and I take it there are 110 from the Department of Agriculture um, that have been revealed. You mentioned the $84 million 
the hours reduced down to 77.8 million. Um, are any of those reductions accounted for in collections that have expired but are continue to be used by the agencies? The numbers that I gave you in my testimony reflect the full amount of the burden, which includes both the the approved and the expired collection. So what I've reflected in terms of a decrease is is the true decrease in, in burden. Uh, we anticipate, we do anticipate making good on those expired collections, and I do not support the notion, I think we ought to focus on the real burden. We will commit to taking care of the administrative problem that we have, but what you see is the real burden reduction. And is it the agency's intention to go to have those expired ones reapproved? I mean, are, there th are they forms the agency wants to Abs continue using? Uh, absolutely. In, in the case is that in all cases or in most cases? Or No, it is our intention to move forward. Now, there have been some forms that we have made a determination that we don't that we do not require. The number, by the way, that I have is, is not, I'm not sure of the, where the 110, I'll have to go back and, and understand the GAO figures. In fact, there's several things in there that aren't consistent with the information that I have. I will uh, say that, that as, of the, uh, as of April 15th, uh, we ha have five actions that are at OMB now pending their review. We have about 18 that are within my office in various stages of review and discussion with the agencies, and 28 that are yet to be filed with my office by the agencies. I have required every agency within USDA to submit a remediation plan for their expired collections. Uh, it is our intention to do everything we can to have, make good on those by the end of this fiscal year. And Okay, good. Uh, I think the 110 are listed in the OMB report, but if if you could go back and get a hold of that annex and the will. staff will provide what what we've got. I will do what I can to reconcile those numbers. Yeah, talk to OMB and talk to GAO. We're holding the record open for 10 days, so if you could get us back something in writing on the reconciliation of that, that would be helpful. Surely. Um, let me ask you one other question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ryan uh, to finish chairing the hearing. We talked briefly in one of the previous panels about perhaps um, putting in some teeth to the bill. And I guess I've got a two-part question. Do you see some of the problems that have occurred arising essentially from the, the subunits at the department not being responsive? Or, or would you attribute some of the problems being the interaction between you and OMB? I guess where, the, where in the link do you, because um, it strikes me you're in the middle there. <laughs> okay, well let me, let me just share with you some of my experience with OMB. Uh, I will not forget one of the very first meetings when I came to the department. This is well before I was the chief information officer, but I was uh, summoned into the office of Sally Katzen, who at the time was the, OI, the head of OIRA. And, and she absolutely read the department, the Riot Act. I mean, this, this was a good many years ago. Uh, we came back and we thought we had taken sufficient action to correct that problem. I will tell you that in the sub-cabinet meetings that I've attended with the Secretary of Agriculture, the subject of paperwork reduction and the importance of this to the administration it came up time and again. It was my understanding that it, in fact, has been the subject of discussion in the President's Management Council, uh, which is chaired by the Vice President. Uh, I, I don't have personal knowledge of that and having attended those meetings, but I will tell you that those things rolled downhill and they rolled right into our sub-cabinet meetings. So I know there has been, I know there has been administration attention to this. Uh, looking at it from the perspective of our agencies, it, it is a challenge to get them to focus on paperwork reduction. There are so many things on their plate right now. The department has gone through extensive downsizing over the last five, six years, a really extraordinary downsizing. And we are faced with delivering increasing numbers of programs. The legislative mandates just keep coming. Right now, we're in the midst of a very serious farm crisis, and I think that, that Keith Kelly can share with you if he has to choose between getting a paperwork requirement in 
and serving the customer, he's gonna he's gonna serve the he's gonna serve the farmer. Uh, yep. But I'll let him speak about his commitment to paperwork reduction, even in the face of that. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Keith Kelly, Administrator of Farm Service Agency, and uh, to the example of the lady that was here testifying, the hog operator that had that AIDS and hogs here, we implemented uh, almost overnight a $50 million hog program, and we're doing all of these emergency programs, a dairy assistance program, a livestock assistance program, a major disaster program, and we're doing it with the same resource of people. And that's at the headquarters, but about a 33% cut of people resources in the last several years. But the dollar outlays have increased uh, almost exponentially, at least significantly. So the decision to come down to is to make sure that she gets her payment, as was intended by Congress when you passed that legislation at the end of Congress last year, or to get to these other things. And regrettably, uh, since we found out what the punishment was for not filling out the Paper Re Reduction Act, uh, we, that went down the priority scale. That's the logical place we went. So uh, I appreciate your candor there, and, and I understand the bind that puts you in. Um, so we'll, we'll, perhaps we need to then look at whether to make that a, a more important priority um, is including that in some of the performance standards, not only for Ms. Reed, but, but others throughout the department. Um, and recognize, frankly, I'm a big believer in using incentives so you can recognize it in the bonus that's paid at the end is rather than necessarily on a punishment side. Mm -hmm. If you're taking on extra job, maybe people are staying extra hours and, and making sure they get the paperwork done, have that reflected there. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ra or, or raise another issue along this line as well on this. You know, sometimes on some of this Paperwork Reduction Act, we've got a major one I know that we're at odds with OMB at that's been out quite some time. And, and we should be following their law, and we should be taking it seriously as what we're trying to do. We have been working with Office of Management Budget in this process, and as good people with in different agencies or different approaches have a difference of opinions. And part of the thing is that sometimes what I think we'd raise a question with is if you don't, uh, if you don't get it in in time and you are in violation of the law, that there's another law that you're, is to be violated if you don't collect some of this information somehow, and that leaves a dilemma, which law do I break today? And, and that needs to be put into the consideration of is the there an appeals program process otherwise. if if the agency and OMB are at loggerheads on a on a paperwork collection item is the, does the administration have a mechanism where they bump it up into the cabinet or we used to have the competitiveness council but when I was in the administration I know they don't okay. anymore but is there a process there where you can do that I would have to say that it is a it is very much the exception and not the rule that we have this kind of of discussion that we engage in and it, it we work it at the staff level we work it at the senior policy level uh, it's now at this particular instance the secretary himself is is prepared to get engaged but it, so you you do move through a process of, of ratcheting yep. it up and, trying and if to the get secretary closer. And, and the the director of OMB if they can't work it out it, then I guess you go to the president at that point. So you, oh, hopefully it will that, not get. Yeah, hopefully you don't have to take those things point. to him. I know <laughs> what you mean. Uh, you want to try to solve the, the what appear to be smaller questions. Sometimes they're larger questions reflected in them. So uh, I appreciate that. And let me now turn it over to Mr. Ryan to finish out this hearing. Thank you both for coming. Thank you for your candor and sort of the, getting a, a feel for the dynamic of how this is working. And I appreciate it. Thank you for coming by, Mrs. Reed. I appreciate both of your, and thank you for your candor. Uh, that's refreshing sometimes. Uh, it wasn't what you want to hear, but at least it's an honest answer. I really appreciate that. I wanted to ask you a quick question. Um, since OMB standard form for agencies to request, you know, to request Paperwork Reduction Act approval includes question if farmers are going to be burdened, have you done a cross-cutting analysis with other agencies that affect farmers with respect to paperwork burdens? We just heard testimony from Ms. Whitfield, a uh, hog farmer from Indiana, I think she was from Muncie, uh, where she had paperwork burden um, placed upon her from other agencies. Have you taken a look at it from the farmer end and taken a look at some of the paperwork burdens imposed on them, and have you coordinated with these agencies to try and reduce that burden? Let me answer that in several ways. Um, first, with respect to the issue that, that she addressed, uh, the the Department of Agriculture did engage in discussions with the uh, with 
EPA in developing the um, strategy for animal feeding operations. Yeah. Uh, we did what we could, I think, to try and represent and to, to get a balance in that strategy. With I've, the other agencies? Uh, with, in this case, EPA. Uh, I believe that, that we will, in fact, be able, the final strategy does, in fact, address some of the issues that, that she raised. Uh, we can go into that later for the record. Uh, in other respects, I have uh, looked, I will not say I've spent a lot of time at this, I'll be very honest about that, but I have looked at the information that OMB ha provides on um, in other, in other agencies and how they affect farms. Uh, quite frankly, from the data that is there, it's really very difficult to get a handle on what the actual extent of that is. Uh, to, to do that, we would need to do further study, and it, and it really may be something we should do. But when I, when I look at that, the other major uh, players are Internal Revenue Service, very clear, EPA, we talked about that. The uh, Department of Transportation, uh, that was one that I sort of scratched my head a little bit over, and when I looked at that in more detail, it, there, there are things like aircraft operations, that many of the farms have um, exactly yeah. and so there there are things that are in that arena uh, but given the data that is available to me today it it's very difficult to parse out exactly what the level of burden is on a farmer because the way in which omb collects it it's it's those forms are filled out by anybody right. they say mm -hmm. it affects some farmers but i don't know how many so as the usda as the ombudsman for the farmer uh, I, I understand it's it's fairly complicated burden. Uh, what I'm hearing, what you're essentially saying is it's just not as high on the priority list given the fact that you're stretched and you're trying to do other things. Um, it doesn't sound like it's very high on the priority list. I understand. I appreciate your candor. Do you see the eventuality of this getting knocked up on the priority list, of doing sort of an assessment of, of, of the nature that we're just talking about here? Well, let, let me just, let me say that Reducing paperwork and doing what we can to support the farmers is a priority for us. Okay. Uh, we we juggle the priorities and how best we can support farmers, but we're it is very much a, depar a department priority to do what we can and get engaged when we see that there's a regulation that's going to whatever department it is that is going to affect farmers. Have we done a specific study on paperwork reduction? across the board for farmers no are we engaged with other agencies in efforts for paperwork reduction yes in the geospatial area we see so much potential advantage in shared information we're active participants not just across the agencies within usda but across the federal government there's a a group that's working to assure that we have common standards for how we collect that information so that we can use it jointly not even just within the federal government but also working very closely in tandem mm -hmm. with the states and the counties and the other levels of government so that we can collectively reduce the burden so so we we do have a commitment in this arena acknowledging your commitment um when will that commitment be honored in your opinion uh it's my understanding that omb's draft report identifies no planned usda paperwork reduction initiatives to benefit father farmers in fy 2000 uh, well, since it, that i understand your commitment is there when when should we there, expect that there are out? several sections to the omb report there is a section that actually that there are, i believe you note five initiatives that where we show the burden hour reduction but in a second section of the report we do address a series of initiatives that are underway at the farm service agency uh, key, yeah. we have not yet pieced out exactly what the burden reduction will be but there's some very serious initiatives. that's what that's what counts to the farmer though at yeah. the end of the day well, but but they will result in a burden reduction. We just haven't quantified it yet. So, Keith, if you could share yeah, some Mr. of that. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, are, we, uh, we're sponsoring, and our agency is sponsoring a companion initiative with the three primary agencies that deliver service in the field, the natural resources, the rural development, and ourselves. And that whole effort is just to get to a common reducing paperwork. I, I don't want to be misunderstood because it is a priority to let farmers farm not fill out paper. Right. That is a goal, and so that is a priority of the agency. And I'd like just to reference the statement that Secretary Glickman gave to us on this whole initiative, 
which is being chaired by our agency, but shared by all of the agencies, that information is collected once and shared many times by USDA service center employees and is appropriate with other public and private entities. Part of the things that we feel we're doing out here, that we're going out and collecting it, they're going out and collecting it, somebody right. else is collecting it, and a third of that is all overlapping each other and being collected. Given the appropriate computer technology to go with that, uh, we have a great confidence of what the one Ann referred to in there, that uh, on geospatial and the whole, uh, that technology, uh, that we can make significant savings to ourselves as well as to the farmers. I mean, with our employment situation we have now, very selfishly, we're trying to get what can we get off the plate for ourselves as well as to our customers. <clears throat> so I, I think it, it, you know, that's our goal. It is a priority there. I don't want to downplay it. It wasn't. It's when you get in a crunch, you set priorities on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes or week to week because of the Kurt Ag crisis. Well, I sure hope we can see some additional action soon. I wanted to ask you just one more quick question. Uh, you, you briefly talked about the hog situation, the comprehensive nutrient management plans. Uh, could you give us some more details on how that paperwork burden uh, will be alleviated? I hear from hog farmers throughout Wisconsin. We have a lot of independent producers. Uh, this is going to cost them about $300 to $1,500 uh, to comply. Uh, it sounds like you're, you're in the midst of, of fulfilling the, the national strategy. Um, I, know, I understand you may not have the answer right now, but could you please provide us with uh, the answer or with the efforts to reduce the paperwork burden with the new uh, management plans? I'd be happy to provide that for the Great. record. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, since there are no more questions, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Just ahead on C-SPAN 2, Elizabeth Dole on American foreign policy in the 21st century. Then columnist Molly Ivins discusses her new book. After that, Chinese premiered